Uh, this is the City of Bloomington Common Council Committee, the whole meeting for Wednesday, uh, April 10th, 2019. We have a quorum, a healthy quorum here. And we have two items tonight on our agenda, on our committee agenda. Ordinance 19-09 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic, amending changes 15.04 definitions, 15.56 bicycle skateboards and other foot propelled vehicles, 15.6 miscellaneous traffic rules, 15.64 traffic violations schedule, and adding a new chapter 15.58 motorized scooters and shared use motorized scooters to provide for regulations governing motorized scooters, shared use motorized scooters, and shared use motorized scooter operators. The second item, Appropriations Ordinance 19-02 to specifically appropriate, to specially appropriate from the general fund, parks general fund, local road and street fund, motor vehicle, highway fund, risk management fund, housing development fund, and vehicle replacement fund expenditures not otherwise appropriated, appropriating a portion of the amount of funds reverted to various city funds at the end of 2018 for unmet needs in 2019. With that, we're ready for our first item, Ordinance 19-09 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code entitled Vehicles and Traffic. Uh, and I think we have several members of the administration here to assist us with this item. Who would like to go first? We have uh, Michael Worker, City Attorney, Mary Catherine Carmichael, Director of Community Engagement, Adam Wayson, Director of Public Works, Mike Dekoff, Police Chief, and Beth Rosenbarger, Planning Services Manager. I'd be happy to go first. Good evening. I'm Mary Catherine Carmichael, Public Engagement Director for the City of Bloomington, Office of the Mayor. I'll keep my comments brief as we have a lot of ground to cover this evening and many, many members of the public interested in comment. Hot Topic Spring continues with Ordinance 19-09 to amend Title 15 of the Bloomington Municipal Code governing uh, regulations governing shared use motorized uh, scooters and shared use motorized scooter operators. The genesis of this ordinance began last fall with the surprise introduction of motorized scooters for rent in Bloomington. Like municipalities across the nation, Bloomington experienced the deployment of hundreds of scooters to our streets, sidewalks, and trails without warning or an opportunity to prepare. You'll recall that shared use motorized vehicle operators, Bird and Lime, were the first to arrive and Spin will be arriving soon. Immediately following the arrival of shared use motorized scooters, the city set about placing some rules and limitations on these scooters, which resulted in temporary interim operating agreements while this ordinance was drafted. Now, with several months of experience, research, and surveying later, we are before you with what we believe to be a good start on, by popular demand, shared use scooter uh, regulations. This proposed ordinance was crafted collaboratively with council and staff input, and thank you, Council Member Voland, for representing this body. That group also included representatives from the legal department, planning and transportation, public works, economic and sustainable development, the Bloomington Police Department, housing and neighborhood development, and the office of the mayor. Hundreds of hours of research and learning have gone into the document you have before you. Council Member Volan and staff examined, considered, and in some cases borrowed from dozens of cities' regulatory models, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Detroit, Memphis, Nashville, Indianapolis, Houston, Miami, Phoenix, and more. We also studied best practices on scooter regulations published by the National Association of City Transportation Officials and the International Municipal Lawyers Association. We spoke with and received feedback from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission, the Council on Community Accessibility, the Board of Public Works, healthcare providers, business operators, scooter companies, Indiana University officials, and neighborhood representatives. Thank you to each of these groups and individuals who worked together to produce this document. Many of them are present this evening to comment or answer your questions. I especially want to thank the thousands of community members, literally, who have weighed in on this topic via one or more of the three public surveys we conducted. Those, surveys result, those survey results are available on our website if you would like to check them out. We also have heard from residents via telephone, emails, letters, and at various meetings. That having said, been said, there is no doubt that for some, this proposed ordinance will go too far, 
and for others it will not go far enough. The feedback we have received indicates some polarization on the topic of scooters, which I'm sure comes as no surprise to each of you who have been hearing from your constituents. Shared use electric scooters are a new phenomenon across the nation and each community with scooters has had to make difficult decisions about what the deployment will look like and feel like in each of their communities. That is the position in which each of you find yourselves tonight. The ordinance was crafted with multiple goals in mind, including maintaining and promoting public safety while integrating this new mode of transportation into our public mobility options, maintaining the right of way in a responsible, accessible fashion that is sensitive to ADA-related and other mobility challenges, providing the framework for scooter operators to pay the costs associated with scooter policy enforcement, Acknowledging and preparing for this constantly evolving industry that will mandate our need to be nimble and adjust as the scooter operations evolve and, cha evolve and change. Find a way to make this mobility option available to as many members of our community as are interested, including those with limited finances. Make the business model as transparent as possible so that we have good information, good data going forward about how best to manage our right of way in light of arrival of shared use scooters. Give the city, giving the city the tools to hold scooter companies accountable so that we can ensure that they are operating as responsible partners within our community and considering all input and points of view both external and internal related to shared use motorized scooters. There is no question that the introduction of shared use motorized scooters has changed the mobility scene in Bloomington. Today we are considering scooters, soon it may be hoverboards or driverless vehicles. As with all of life, the only thing we can be sure of is that change will occur and that we will be called upon to manage it. Manage it. We don't promote this ordinance as a be all end all solution to the issues that have arisen as a result of this new form of mobility. However, we do expect this ordinance to set the groundwork for sound public policy that allows for motorized scooter rental while not unduly threatening or inconveniencing the community. Thank you, and I'd now like to introduce City Attorney Mike Rooker for an overview of the ordinance. I appreciate your attention. Thank you, Ms. Carmichael. Thanks, Mary Catherine. Thank you, council members. Michael Rooker, city attorney for the city of Bloomington. Um, we have presented to you tonight proposed ordinance 19-09, which governs, as Mary Catherine said, motorized scooters. Now, my portion here is going to be a lot more boring than hers. We're going to get down into the nuts and bolts and the meat and potatoes of this. Uh, so let's just jump right into it. So the first question that comes up is, what jurisdiction does a city have to regulate these businesses in the first place? And there are a couple of reasons that local regulations are appropriate for shared use motorized scooters. First off, anytime anybody is conducting commerce in the public right of way, cities have a responsibility to take uh, a role in managing that commerce. And we do that in all sorts of contexts already. We regulate food trucks, taxi cabs, velo cabs, push carts, news racks, of course, if you're a restaurant owner and you want to put an encroachment into the public right-of-way, we regulate that as well. If you wanted to set up a stand outside of the showers complex on the sidewalk tonight and sell your wares, you'd have to get permission to do that first. So public uh, entities like scooter companies that use the public right-of-way are, of course, no different. Uh, and again, in addition to commerce, we have a role in regulating and ensuring the safe passage of members of the public in our right-of-way. So that means we have to take into account pedestrians, vehicles, bicycles, scooters, and all manner of other conveyances that want to use the public right-of-way. And again, this is nothing new for the council, right? You've established regulations governing transportation uh, that's quite similar to motorized scooters, including bicycles, skateboards, non-motorized scooters, and other small motorized conveyances. So. That's how we get uh, to regulation. Now, before we jump into the actual uh, regulations themselves, we should establish a couple of definitions. First off, motorized scooters are defined, and for the purposes of this ordinance, motorized scooters and shared use motorized scooters are substantially identical, defined substantially identically, excuse me. Um, a motorized scooter is a conveyance or a device propelled by a motor that doesn't have a seat but that it has two or more wheels in contact with the ground and has a floorboard for the user to stand upon. Now a shared use motorized scooter, that term is subsumed by motorized scooter and all that means is a motorized scooter that's held out for rent by the public. Now what we don't mean by motorized scooter is a device 
that's used to aid a person with a disability, so not a motorized wheelchair. We don't mean bicycles or motorized bicycles, and we certainly don't mean coasters, which are uh, skateboards or non-motorized scooters or roller skates, and that is a defined term in the city code. A um, couple of other definitions in the ordinance, shared use motorized scooter operator, that I'm not gonna read that long definition, but that essentially means motorized scooter company. So we have two in town right now, Bird and Lime, and SPIN has now signed an interim operating agreement with the city, and we do anticipate that they will be arriving in the near term. Uh, and then the final defined term is the dismount zone. Now this is a zone uh, that was previously identified by the city council in uh, previous ordinances related to bicycles. Uh, the dismount zone is an area of downtown where bicycles and similar devices are not permitted on sidewalks. Now some people may not know this, but the general rule in Bloomington is that you can ride a bicycle or a skateboard or a scooter on a sidewalk. There are, however, a few blocks where you can't do that, and that's the dismount zone. So the dismount zone covers the streets that are indicated on the screen, uh, 4th Street from Indiana to, to Grant, so that's in front of all those beautiful restaurants that I like to go to for lunch. Uh, Kirkwood Avenue from Indiana to Morton Street, so from the sample gates down to the B line. 6th Street, two blocks just from Walnut over to Morton, basically to the B line. And then Walnut Street and College Avenue along the square, and then one block north and south of the square in that direction. Okay, so what are we regulating with Ordinance 19.09? We are regulating a few things. Number one, we establish rules on licensing. So uh, companies that want to use the public right of way to conduct their business have to get a license from the Board of Public Works. Ordinance, proposed Ordinance 19-09 also uh, regulates parking, proposes regulating parking of shared use motorized scooters and other motorized scooters. The ordinance also, of course, uh, regulates use for all motorized scooters, including shared use motorized scooters. Uh, Ordinance 1909 also proposes some safety requirements for shared use motorized scooters. Uh, it imposes some data transmission requirements so that the city can get some good information about how these companies are operating. Uh, it imposes some public outreach and public education requirements on scooter companies. It also establishes some affordability requirements so that shared use motorized scooters can be available to all members of our community. And then of course, uh, as with all ordinances, there is an enforcement provision so that violators can be penalized to encourage uh, compliance. So what does Ordinance 19-09 do? So the first section is on licensing. Any company that wants to uh, operate as a shared use motorized scooter operator, so that's a scooter company, has to get a license from the Board of Public Works. The licenses are good for one year and they, mit they must be renewed annually. Uh, and and uh, in establishing licenses, the board has delegated a handful of a couple of, uh, couple of pieces of authority. First, they can establish limits on the number of scooters that a shared use motorized scooter operator may deploy. Uh, and second, the board is required to establish fees that are gonna be charged back to, uh, to scooter companies. Now those fees under state law have to be reasonably related to the administrative, administrative cost of regulating shared use motorized scooters. Uh, so the city has to try to take stock of what it's going to cost to make sure that the, the scooter companies are complying with the rules and the fees have to, have to be related to those expenses. Some of the expenses we know we're going to see in regulating these devices are, of course, enforcement. So folks are going to have to make sure that these scooters are parked and located correctly. And then also we're going to have to have law enforcement folks who regulate their use. Of course, there are going to be fees for infrastructure as well. So not just infrastructure improvement, like perhaps additional bicycle lanes, but if we're going to do parking in particular ways, like painted boxes, uh, we're going to have to designate uh, those boxes by painting them and maintaining them, probably putting up some bollards or delineators, and then also putting some bicycle loops within those painted boxes as well. So there are expenses associated with all of those things. And then, of course, if we're going to be converting potentially some downtown metered parking spaces into painted boxes for scooter parking, we're gonna to wanna to recoup the lost revenue from those metered spaces in the form of licensing fees charged back to the scooter companies. Uh, and then of course there are always those little clerical expenses around the side, uh, around, on the side associated with um, license application processing, uh, potentially participating in some of the public outreach uh, meetings as well by city staff. So those are the expenses we anticipate. Under ordinance, proposed ordinance 1909, uh, the license application to the Board of Public Works has to contain at least the following information, the maximum number of scooters the company plans to deploy, descriptions and pictures of the scooters that will be deployed, a schedule of rates and charges that the company will charge the public, detailed staffing and operational plans, including local staffing plans so that we know 
how many folks are going to be around Bloomington to help out with whatever uh, service needs are required. Uh, maps depicting the company's proposed service area. A 24-hour customer service number that has to be staffed by the company. We want to see all the plans for the public outre outreach programs that are required by Ordinance 1909. And then, of course, uh, what we lawyers call risk transfer, which means indemnification and insurance language to protect taxpayers from liability in the event that there's a claim related to scooter use. OK, so that's the basic licensing regime. Uh, and of course, Ordinance 1909 also discusses parking. Now, this is quite possibly the stickiest part of the ordinance. Um, just as a, a threshold matter, for the most part, these parking regulations apply to both motorized scooters that are privately owned and shared use motorized scooters. Uh, there are, in the regime that's set up by proposed ordin ordinance 1909, two basic sets of rules. There are those rules that apply in the dismount zone and then those rules that apply everywhere else. So again, what is the dismount zone? It's that previously established area where bicycles and coasters can't be used on the sidewalk. They must be used in the road or in a bicycle lane or you have to dismount when you enter the dismount zone. Uh, and again, where is the dismount zone? We discussed this already, but 4th Street, Kirkwood, 6th, and then north and south, we have Walnut Street and College Avenue, and in the most populated parts of, of downtown. So what are the rules in the dismount zone? We'll get to everywhere else in a second. But in the dismount zone, parking is uh, limited. You can't park on sidewalks in the dismount zone except at bicycle racks. So you can park at bicycle racks anywhere. Uh, other than that, parking is permitted only within designated painted boxes that will be painted on the street. Um, and this is a nice, tidy way to say, look, if you're going to operate scooters, keep them in the street in this area. Park them in the street, operate them in the street, don't put them on the sidewalk. We don't want them in the dismount zone on the sidewalk at all. Uh, what are painted boxes? So that's another question as well. These are on street areas for parking scooters or bicycles. We're going to make them available, or the idea is to make them available for either scooters or bikes. Um, and now where are we going to put these painted boxes? We've been looking at a lot of areas, and we're going to continue to have conversations about it. Uh, one place where they will almost certainly go is in areas where we currently have designated bike share. Uh, unfortunately, our bike share program, which is done through PACE or, or Zagster, is going away uh, in the next few weeks. And we have a number of on-street bike, bike share areas that are going to be converted as a result of that. So that's unfortunate, but it does, make, uh, it does make some space available for scooters. I think we have four of those downtown, if I've counted them right, one at Morton and 6th Street, one on 6th Street, right on the square there in the middle of the block, then one next to People's Park on Dunn, and another on-street parking area, uh, I think at 4th Street and Dunn, uh, right there in the, in the dismount zone. So, so those will be prime candidates for repurposing. Uh, in addition, there are 12 to 14 meter spaces that staff has identified at the moment for possible conversion from on-street metered parking to painted boxes. Uh, so we're going to look at that. And then, of course, we've also identified some yellow curb areas for use. Now, yellow curb areas are areas uh, where you can't park, either because you're going to create a site hazard by placing a vehicle too close to an intersection, or because the space just isn't big enough to safely fit a vehicle. And those are sort of uh, what we would call some of the lower hanging fruit uh, here, where you can put scooters without creating any problems uh, from an engineering perspective. So we've identified some of those spaces in the dismount zone as well. Of course, further conversation on where further conversations on where we're going to locate painted boxes are going to be had with downtown businesses, with the Parking Commission, with Bike and Ped, and of course with the Board of Public Works, which at the end of the day has ultimate authority over how the right-of-way is managed. So. so just to give you a sense about what painted boxes look like, here's an example of uh, Lime Access bikes in a painted box. This one's on a sidewalk. Um, here's some painted boxes. This one ramps down to the road. This is designated scooter parking again, so you can sort of see what this looks like. And then here's an example of on-street parking. So if you're going to do this in an area, this is an obvious area where you, you couldn't put a car, uh, but it's, it's an area that's disused and would otherwise sort of be perfect for either bike share or uh, scooter share parking. OK, so that's the dismount zone, painted boxes or bike racks. That's the rule in the dismount zone under the proposed ordinance. What do you do outside of the dismount zone? So outside the dismount zone, parking is permitted on sidewalks. However, there are some serious restrictions on that. Uh, scooters have to be parked if they're parked on the sidewalk outside the dismount zone to leave a clear straight pathway at least 54 inches wide. 
And that's a nice tidy number because uh, it's, that's the ADA's requirement for um, keeping space on the sidewalk. And it's also a requirement that's repeated in the city code in a number of places, including encroachments on the sidewalk. Uh, scooters have to be parked up, upright so they, do, they don't take up as much space. Of course, when they're on their side, uh, they take up a lot more of the right of way than when they're parked upright. And then scooters may never be parked so as to impede any number of facilities. You can see the list there. That includes parking spaces, including parking access aisles, which are those spaces next to accessible parking spaces, uh, loading zones, curb ramps, any public transportation infrastructure, driveways, building entrances and exits, commercial window displays, any emergency facilities like fire hydrants or utility poles or call boxes, and we don't want them impeding parking meters, street furniture, or news racks either. So those are all prohibited ways to park a scooter on the sidewalk under the ordinance. There are some additional regulations on parking as well. Uh, as I said, this is a really important part of it, so it, it, this is a big part of the ordinance. Uh, so scooters may never be parked so as to impede ADA accessibility, and again, I think we've captured the main requirements in some of the other sections, which are to, to leave that 54-inch pathway, not to block accessible parking spaces, and not to block curb ramps. Uh, but in the event there's something we've missed or there are some changes in the future, this is sort of a catch-all provision that's included in the ordinance. Uh, scooters may also not be parked on unimproved surfaces, so you can't park them on grass. They have to be parked on asphalt or concrete. Uh, and they may not be parked within the confines of a special event. So we don't want shared-use shared motorized scooters located in within the confines of Lotus or B-Town Boom or 4th Street. We want those spaces to be reserved just for those special events. Um, and then of course, we don't want them parked in the street or in alleys, and that creates an obvious dangerous hazard for vehicles, so that's clearly prohibited. Uh, other than that, parking is generally prohibited on public property. However, there is an exception to that. If one of those entities, one of those boards that controls some of the city's public property wants to grant an exception, they can do so. So for example, if the Redevelopment Commission wants to say, we're going to designate scooter parking in the Trades District, they can identify discrete areas of the Trades District and designate those as, as scooter parking. Same with the Board of Park Commissioners. If uh, when the switchyard park is ready for business next year. If they have some areas of the switchyard park that are ideal for scooter parking, they can designate those uh, themselves. So. Uh, and then finally, uh, the ordinance does require shared use motorized scooter users to take a photograph demonstrating where they park their scooters at the, at the conclusion of their ride. So uh, this is also already something that some of the scooter companies are requiring, but we did want to make sure it's required by all of the scooter companies. Finally, enforcement. So what happens when a scooter is not properly located or not properly parked? Uh, and we have a couple of tools available to us to deal with situations like that. First off, shared use motorized scooters may be relocated. So if they simply need to be moved a couple of feet, the city is, is free under the terms of the ordinance to pick them up and move them a couple of feet. Uh, and then there may be fines as well. So an illegally parked scooter will subject the company or the user to a $30 or $60 fine. That's consistent with what's, uh, what's charged for illegally parked bicycles and other devices. And the fine may be assessed even if we choose to do relocation and make the right-of-way safe. If we take a picture, we can still go ahead and assess that fine. If it gets bad enough, of course, impoundment is something that is permitted under the ordinance. And the impoundment fine is $100 plus $10 per day that we have to store a scooter that is impounded. If we store that scooter for 180 days and have to dispose of it, the disposal fine is $100, $150. And the reason it's so much is because these devices are powered by lithium ion batteries and it turns out that those are particularly difficult to get rid of and recycle. So. Okay, in addition to parking, Ordinance 1909 regulates scooter use. Um, and again, these regulations are gonna largely mirror what you're familiar with with regard to bicycles and other small motorized devices. Uh, and again, just like in parking, these regulations apply to all motorized scooters for the most part, whether they're shared use motorized scooters or just a privately owned scooter. So, where may a scooter generally be used? It can be used in the roadway, just like a bicycle. It can be used within bicycle lanes, and we have uh, proposed an alteration to the section of the city code on bicycle lanes to suggest that scooters uh, are also permitted there. Uh, they may be used on sidewalks, trails, and paths, but of course, not on sidewalks in the dismount zone. That's what the proposed ordinance says today. 
There are some additional requirements, of course, and again, these mirror very much what we see with bicycles. Any users of a, a, a scooter have to yield the right-of-way to pedestrian and must pass pedestrians at a distance of at least three feet or get off their scooter. And that's, again, with sidewalks and trails in mind. Uh, riders have to give an audible signal, either ding a bell or say, on your left, when passing a pedestrian who's traveling in the same direction. Again, these are the same requirements for bicycles. And uh, when passing an individual with a visual impairment, scooter riders are supposed to get off of their scooters before passing if they uh, can't pass without startling, inconveniencing, or colliding uh, with said person. While riding on a sidewalk uh, near where there's a curb cut and a vehicle may be approaching for whatever reason, from an alley or a driveway or coming out of a parking garage, scooter users are supposed to slow down to pedestrian speed. And again, this is something we already require of bikes, and it's just being passed on to scooters. A new one here is that users are not supposed to operate a motorized scooter while controlling an animal. So uh, obviously that's been observed and so that requirement is included in the ordinance. And then uh, there's also a prohibition on double riding. And if you look around town, I think you'll probably observe double riding from time to time. And that's where somebody rents a scooter and instead of uh, having their, their buddy pay to also rent a scooter, they just share the scooter. Um, and there are obvious risks associated with that, so the ordinance proposes uh, prohibiting that. When you violate these rules, uh, it depends on what rule you're violating. If you violate a state traffic rule, you're gonna be subject to penalties imposed by state law. So if you go the wrong way down a one-way road, you are gonna get a ticket from an officer who sees you do that, and that ticket's gonna be consistent with what's required by state law. Uh, if you run a red light or blow through a traffic, excuse me, a stop sign, you're also gonna get a ticket, and that ticket's gonna be consistent with what's required under state law. Municipal violations, on the other hand, are subject to $20 penalties, just like uh, for violations for bicycles, uh, skateboards, and non-motorized scooters. So if you're riding in the dismount zone, it's a $20 ticket, a class, a class G traffic violation. All right, so in addition to some requirements on use, uh, there are also some requirements for safety that are imposed on shared use motorized scooters and their operators. First off, scooters may not be rented or used by persons under the age of 18. And again, this is something we're seeing some scooter companies already voluntarily do. Uh, and then this is perhaps one of the more important ones. All scooters have to be governed so that they cannot travel faster than 15 miles per hour. So scooter operators are required to deploy their equipment that way. Uh, of course, the scooters also have to have a bell, a horn, or other signaling device on them so we can comply with some of the requirements of safe use near pedestrians. And there are requirements for lights and brakes that are consistent with what's currently being proposed up at the State House. And then finally, there are some scooter, uh, some requirements on hours of operation. So scooter operators under the ordinance may not hold scooters out for rent between 10.01 p.m. and 5.59 a.m. Uh, so there are some risk factors associated with uh, riding scooters in the darkness. Uh, and of course, intoxication is more likely as well at that time of night. So, uh, so that's another reason for those restrictions. There are some requirements as well for uh, safety purposes for items that must be displayed on each scooter. First off, each scooter has to have a unique identification number right on it that anybody can read uh, so that they can call the required 24-hour number and say, hey, the brakes on scooter X are not working correctly or the lights are not functioning. Uh, also, we wanna see the company's website and mobile application information directly on the scooter itself. And then the ordinance also requires users to, uh, excuse me, the ordinance also requires companies to tell users by putting right on the scooter itself that users, a handful of admonitions, number one, users are required to obey all traffic laws, that they're required to yield to pedestrians, that they're required to follow proper parking procedures, and that they are encouraged to wear helmets. Now, helmet use is not mandatory. As you know, in Indiana, helmet use is not mandatory for a motorcycle even, so uh, they're, they're not mandatory under the ordinance for scooter users either. It is strongly encouraged, however, so. Uh, there's also a remote, locked, a remote lockdown provision in ordinance 1909, so shared use motorized scooters have to remotely lock down any scooter that is deemed unsafe to operate or reported unsafe to operate by anyone. So as soon as they get a report that a particular scooter is defective, inoperable, isn't functioning correctly, they gotta remotely lock that down, show up within two hours, pick up the scooter and evaluate it. And if the, the companies aren't willing to do that and we have to pick it up, we're gonna impound it and we're gonna fine them, uh, not just, we're gonna fine them and charge them impoundment fees as well, so. 
Ordinance 1909 also contains some requirements for reporting data. There are two types of data that are required to be reported under the ordinance, real-time data, and then also some periodic monthly reports. Uh, all information that's provided, either real-time data or monthly reports, has to be scrubbed of any personally identifiable information. We want everything anonymized. We don't want names, addresses, phone numbers, certainly don't want any payment information. Uh, so we don't want any of that stuff. The, the scooter companies can keep that. Uh, but we do want some real-time data, and we want it to comply with what's uh, identified as a national standard, the Mobility Data Specification, or MDS, format. That's an open source format that's used by cities across the country. I believe it was first established by Los Angeles, uh, and everybody's sort of using that as the, the national standard now. MDS provides real-time data about how many scooters are in use, where they're located, and what their physical condition is. We also want to get some monthly reports. Uh, the monthly reports under Ordinance 1909 must include information about each individual trip, including trip distance, duration, cost, start and end time, and start and end location. We also want to know uh, monthly information about scooter accidents, scooter collisions, and we also want some information about any scooters that are removed due to unauthorized scooter parking by the companies. In addition to data sharing requirements, Ordinance 1909 also imposes some public outreach requirements. Uh, there are four broad public outreach categories and a handful of information that has to be shared during each one of these uh, outreach moments, I guess. Uh, so first off, uh, there has to be a Bloomington-specific notice to first-time users of scooters through the company's mobile application. Uh, and then there also has to be a Bloomington-specific page on the company's website. And we also ask the companies to do two on-the-ground safety campaigns per year in Bloomington. Now, all of that information, all the information, that certain information has to be transmitted through each of those uh, applications or websites or the, the safety campaigns. We want information transmitted about the city's local regulations governing scooter use and also governing scooter parking. Uh, we want also information transmitted about best practices regarding safe scooter use. Uh, and then, uh, in addition, we also want the scooters, the scooter companies to talk about the affordability and accessibility requirements that the city imposes on scooter companies. Uh, in addition to those public outreach and educa education requirements, Ordinance 1909 also requires helmet distribution uh, to local users at a local location and at no cost by the scooter companies. Uh, so I just mentioned that we want, as part of the public outreach, uh, affordability to be talked about. Ordinance 1909 does require scooter companies to provide a price discount in an effort to make scooters more widely available to the community. And that price discount will take the form in the ordinance of a 50% price discount to any potential users who can demonstrate participation in any federal, state, or local assistance program. Now, that price discount is intended to be applied to any and all charges associated with renting a shared use motorized scooter. So an unlocking fee or any sort of uh, time delineated charge. And of course, uh, as with many parts of the ordinance, if the Board of Public Works determines that it wants to impose additional affordable or accessibility requirements on scooter companies, it can do that through the licensing procedure uh, that's outlined at the beginning of the ordinance. So finally, we get to enforcement. Uh, and there are a number of tools that the city has for making sure that scooter companies uh, follow the rules. Of course, there are fines, which we've talked about already. Fines for illegal use for municipal violations are $20. Of course, for state law violations, those are going to be set by state law. Fines for illegal parking are $30 or $60, depending on when payment is made. And then uh, fines assessed against scooter companies are generally going to be subject to what we call the general penalty provision of the city code. That authorizes fines up to $2,500. So if somebody's operating as a scooter company without first obtaining a license, they're going to be fined at least $2,500 per day for doing that. If they're not meeting the other requirements that are imposed for safety, for example, not governing their scooters at an appropriate speed, that's going to result in a, in a much larger fine. Uh, then there, of course, is impoundment as an option. We've talked about this already. Any scooter that presents a public hazard or is parked illegally may be impounded. That entails a $100 impoundment fine, a $10 per day storage fine, and then a $150 disposal fine if that becomes necessary. And then finally, maybe the, the ultimate penalty for a scooter company that really doesn't want to comply with the local provisions or state law is that the Board of Public Works can initiate revocation proceedings, which would involve a hearing. So. Um, that's sort of the broad contours of the ordinance itself. Uh, we have a number of folks here to answer questions. We have Adam Wason, Director of Public Works, Mike Dekoff, who is the police chief, 
Alex Crowley from Economic and Sus Sustainable Development, and, and of course, Mary Catherine, who you heard from earlier. So, oh, and Beth Rosenbarger from P&T as well, if you have questions related to, to planning and transportation. Thank you, Mr. Rooker. So there are no other uh, initial comments from any other members of the administration? Not at this time, no. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Rooker. We'll move to council member questions right now. Council member Rallo. Mr. Rooker, um, you mentioned in your introduction that a vendor setting up a, a business in front of City Hall would need permission to apply for a permit and so forth, but these companies never, uh, n never sought permission. They simply dumped their, their product on, on, on Bloomington, on the community. Um, I wondered if we could have uh, maybe some response from the representatives of the company in terms of their business model. Uh, is, this, is this the, in other words, is this a proper way of, of introducing your product? Uh, certainly, if, if one of them wants to speak, that's fine. I would mention just very briefly that um, Bird and Lime did sort of show up last September. Uh, Spin, who has been working with us to get the, the agreement executed, has been very clear that they want to have everything in place before they start deploying scooters. So. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Deventer, do you want to, to address that? And do we have a representative from Bird here this evening? Could they speak to? No. There is no representative from Bird. They didn't choose. Were they invited? But they, they chose not to come? Okay, thanks. Uh, last September when uh, the scooter show. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm David Van Deventer. I'm the operations manager for Lime here in Bloomington. Um, I was not working for the company last September whenever the launch occurred. Um, in this capacity, I was as a charger, um, but I can't speak to that. Um, I know that we are trying to work more with cities in advance um, as we continue to launch other markets and stuff like that. So um, I feel like the company's kind of learned their lesson and are trying to do better in the future. But this is, sta this is standard operating procedure, isn't it? Isn't, uh, isn't this how my... Lime and Bird, essentially, they, they simply drop the product and then, and then things are settled later? We have to catch up in terms of re regulation instead of negotiating. Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with us first before simply dropping the product on a community? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, it's well, not a standard that. operating procedure that I know of, but like I said, I'm not privy to all the stuff. so. I understand. Okay, thank right. you. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Chopra? Yes, I have a question, and anyone can hop up and answer it from the administration, and I hope that it's not read as, and I'm sure you won't after this meeting, read it as such, uh, my opinion on the matter. Uh, but I think it, it's an important question to start with, which is why not just ban the motorized scooters in, in total, I mean, let's, let's, are, are there benefits? Are there reasons for just saying we don't want these at all? <clears throat> Hi, Alex Crowley, I'm Director of Economic Sustainable Development. It's a good question. Uh, some cities have actually done it. Um, I, think, um, I think it's the administration's position that um, this kind of disruptive technology can be really jarring at first, and, and it certainly can cause the city to, to put up the wall. But the future of micromobility, uh, of mobility generally, um, will be a little bumpy, um, but that things like scooters and you know, bike share, um, they're all part of a fabric of mobility options that hopefully work together to reduce the reliance on single occupancy vehicle use. Um, my personal experience is, you know, I can use a scooter to get to a bus, right? So they all work together. Mr. Chair, may I ask one more short question before moving on, and then I'll reserve the rest of mine for later? Yeah, but before oh. you ask that, sure. would you mind if I ask, um, 
Ms. Rosenbarger to address, because she's the transportation oh, yeah, expert sure. here, to answer your question. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, as a, absolutely. From a transportation staff perspective. Okay, it's Beth Rosenbarger, Planning and Transportation Department. Um, I actually would mimic what Alex said. I think transportation and the landscape of transportation is changing a lot. We're going to continue to see changes, but as a city, we have a lot of goals around reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reducing single occupancy vehicle use. So scooters are, have the potential to be one of the solutions among several, and I don't think there's only one thing that will get us there as a community to make those reductions. Okay. Thank you. Now you may proceed with your next question. Sure. Um, I have several, but I'll just do one for now. And um, it'll back up to the uh, slide about the definitions. Uh, were, are these new definitions, or are they definitions that were already codified? These are new definitions. So these are definitions that are being added to Title 15. Um, because they were not there before. So okay. sort of the way we had done regulations is the definition of bicycle included uh, sort of a catch-all that said similar motorized devices are also defined as a bicycle. That really wasn't clear and created a lot of confusion. So we wanted to be clear that this is what we mean by scooter uh, and that it doesn't mean bicycle. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I do want to follow up. I'm sorry. I know I said it was right short ahead. and then it wasn't. but. Um, is the part about neither term includes in the code? Because I do understand that we've been trying to move away from person with a disability language, and I didn't know if that would be actually codified or if that was. Uh, th that language is actually codified, but uh, if there is a preferred way it's to. proposed to be, right? It, that's correct. Okay. Um, and I don't, I'd have to take, let me take a quick look to see if that specific phrase is used. Give me okay. a moment. Um, but. We do say we don't mean particular particular terms. Right. I just, uh, you know, maybe for next time it comes back, would mention that that's not a term that I don't think we're wanting to use any longer. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Sandberg, I think, was next. Yes, thank you. Um, with respect to now having three companies uh, competing in the market, um, do we have an idea of capacity, how much the market could be possibly saturated with these scooters when it comes to setting the caps? Do we now know what a reasonable cap would be now that we're going to have three companies in the pool? So we do think that that's going to be a market-driven solution. We don't know what that is right now. Um, based on the information, a snapshot that we were given recently, we uh, understand that they're in the neighborhood of 500 scooters operating right now. That's between two companies. Um, what the ultimate sweet spot uh, for the companies involved is going to land at, we don't really know yet. Um, you know, we had a short warm season before it got cold. I think that both scooter companies learned quite a lot during that period. Um, and then we're going to have another uh, brief period before school lets out of warm weather and kind of the uh, maximum number of potential customers. And then I, I understand that they are flexible and nimble enough that they'll dial back the number of scooters available um, because they simply won't have, when school is out, they simply won't have the, the number of customers to support um, a greater deployment. Mm -hmm. And again, my question is concerning, if we're already having issues with blocked sidewalks and ADA compliance, the more we have, the more problems that's going to cause. But is this profitable for these three companies now in competition if they're going to have less scooters on you know, in operation? That's a very reasonable question. It's a great question. It's one we're wondering the answer to also. You know, I can't emphasize enough that we're all on a giant learning curve with this. This is, this is new for all of us. I would say that, again, I do know they have, they're nimble enough to, it may be um, instead of 250 and 250, it's, you know, 175, you know, adding up to hit that same number, but, um, just fewer per company, or they a company may decide, you know what, Bloomington's not a big enough market, um, it's not worth our time, and they may disappear. So I, again, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I, I would really wish I had the answer to those uh, questions. Okay, going thank into you. This. I have more questions, but I'll pass for now. Okay, uh, was it first Councilmember Sims, then Councilmember Sturbon. Yeah, this is for Chief oh. Deacon. Sims, then Sturbon. 
Oh, Sam's then, sir, pardon me. I misunderstood. Ladies first. <laughs> oh, you want me to go? He's not. Okay. okay, we're going. So, do you anticipate having your officers stop people who drive too close to walkers and who drive carelessly and run out into the street? And is it a, what kind of offense is it if you run a stop sign from a sidewalk? Like you're riding on a sidewalk and you run a stop sign? Is that a local offense or is that actually running a stop sign? So, Mike Dekoff, Police Chief for the City of Bloomington. Um, so, to answer your last question, uh, the statute would apply if you're in the roadway running a stop sign, not from a sidewalk. So the sidewalk offense could be a local So if you're riding on a sidewalk, statute. can you just zoom into the intersection and where there's a stop sign? That would, that's local, that would, that's not a... Exactly. Wow. Okay. Um, as to your other questions, there, you know, there are only... Violations can only be enforced if an officer witnesses something. And so... Um, you know, having an average of eight to ten officers patrolling the entire city, um, we will do our best to enforce it, but we cannot be everywhere watching every scooter. So there will be violations that will be missed, um, but that's, that goes along with every type of traffic violation. So what if there was someone that worked for Public Works and could observe people breaking rules and reporting them to police? Would Again, that be a it, witness? It has, to, it has to be witnessed by a police officer. So if somebody it. hits a pedestrian, drives off, and the guy who's kind of watching him follows him and sees him and reports that he saw him hit a pedestrian and drive off, can't do anything because you no, didn't see I'm not, it No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is they, a, a citizen could not say, I witnessed him run a stop sign, write him a ticket. In that instance, where someone is actually struck, that is something that we can still investigate right. um, and, and take some kind of action probably still. What if the city hired someone to work for Public Works to oversee scooter uh, violations? Could they then report, I mean, they could do education, but they could also report bad parking. They could report uh, people who are driving unsafely. They could report violations to police, and couldn't police then write a ticket based on that person's reporting? Again, it, it depends on what the violation is. So state statute would require a police officer to witness a state violation of a state traffic law. Um, ordinances can be handled differently, but if, it's, if, a ticket is, if a state citation, a traffic ticket, is actually written, that has to be witnessed by a police officer. What about all these minor offenses that are local? Who, who writes there are, there are a variety of people who can write ordinance tickets. I would, um, I think we need to be cautious with who would do that because, again, it's a violation and people, you know, they're, they're going to get upset about that and we don't want to put people who don't have that experience in dealing with, you know, members of the public who are upset um, writing, writing citations. So if there was sort of a scooter patrol person, would you want them to be in the pub, in the police department, or would you want them to be in public works? I think that's something that we would have to discuss. That needs some more discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Sims. Thank you, um, and I'm going to piggyback a little bit on what Councilmember Chopra was was starting to get at. I think, um, and I think this is for you, Mr. Rooker. And please understand, I'm not advocating one way or another, but I think where we were headed is, is can we legally just flat out deny scooters? Would you be permitted to say, this is not a type of commerce we want to have in our public right of way? Yes. Yes, sir. You would be able to do that. Okay. I not don't that know that that's Not that I'm advocating one way or another, but I think okay. that's where that question was headed. And I would say, I don't know that that's a, a response that we're seeing. Right. At least I have not seen that response in other communities. We have seen some communities that have responded to the business model where scooters arrive before getting permission to be in the right of way uh, by picking them all up and, and saying, we're not going to have them until they're regulated. But I haven't seen, and you may know more than me, council members, but I haven't seen a, a, a city that's just said, no, we're not going to have any. There are some cities that have, have decided they're going to do very limited numbers of pilot, a pilot program with a very small number of motorized scooters, but that's as close as I've seen to that model. Okay, thank you. Um, Go continue. Um, from a liability standpoint, um, if there's a collision or an injury or an accident of some sort and there's 
damage or personal injury and the scooter person is at fault, where does liability fall there? So that's going to be a question that depends on a lot of factors. So there are any number of, of folks who could have been negligent, right? So if the scooter wasn't functioning properly mm -hmm. for some reason, certainly you can see how a scooter company might have been negligent uh, in that way. If the scooter user wasn't using it properly and then they're negligent for operating a scooter dangerously, um, they, could be, they could be responsible for their own injury. Um, you, know, you, you might find some folks who would say, so, so there are any number, of, there are any number of, of, it's going to depend on the facts specifically. What we're going to do, or at least what the ordinance suggests doing, the proposed ordinance, is transferring that risk to, to the scooter companies to say, if you want to have your business operating in the public's right of way, we're not going to, the city and the city's taxpayers aren't going to take on any risk of liability. So if we get a claim, you're going to assume responsibility for handling it. And you're going to have adequate insurance to, to make sure that that can be paid as well. Okay, and that covers the company and the users. What about someone that's not involved with that? And they are the ones that have been injured or so some sort of damage. Yeah, so they Is would that? have, just like anybody else who suffered uh, property damage or personal injury, they would have a cause of action against the responsible party. And, you know, in lots of circumstances where it's not clear, if potentially this, you know, a company or an individual were responsible, you'll see a... a a plaintiff's attorney or an attorney, just name everybody as a defendant and then let a court sort out who was ultimately responsible for, for paying that claim. Okay. I'll ask some more later. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Granger. Thank you. Um, my first question is, um, well, I'm going to go back to the companies. Um, have you met with uh, Lime and Bird, and have they been amenable to regulations that you're proposing or that we're proposing? It, uh, it sounds like you've already you've met with Spin, correct? And they're amenable. Or? So, so we have run the ordinance past the scooter companies, and we have some comments back. Obviously, uh, the interim operating agreements were negotiated with the scooter companies, so there were lots of conversations at that time. Uh, and we do, we have had some conversations with the scooter companies, of course, about, about the regulations. We will probably continue to have conversations with them as well uh, as we figure out, just like every city around the country, the best pathway forward for regulating these devices. So. And either they will agree to those regulations or they'll pull their business, right? Obviously, we're not requiring anybody to be here, so if they choose not to operate in yeah. Bloomington, that's up to them. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Councilor Piedmont Smith. Yes, I think um, my biggest questions, I, I have many specific questions, but my, my biggest general question is about enforcement. Um, because we had this discussion uh, when we, just, uh, we allowed bicycles on sidewalks, and uh, it's, you know, I think it's still an issue. Um, I don't know if, um, if Chief Decoff or, or Mr. Wason or, or anybody can speak further to this. Um, perhaps it would be interesting if you could give us some feedback on uh, how the bikes on sidewalks, how enforcement of those rules has gone in the um, year or two since we've had that allowance. Can anybody speak to that? I think that's relevant. Since I wasn't prepared to address, I don't know how many tickets have been issued. Um, I, I didn't anticipate that question, so I, I'm not sure what that is. I can look and see and get that information to you, but I don't, I don't know that right now. Yeah, I would appreciate having okay. that information for next week. Okay. Does it, have there been other, uh, has there been other relevant feedback regarding bicycles that might be relevant to the scooters, to, to other departments maybe in the city? No? Okay. Uh, no, the only thing I would add um, is that um, I sent each of you a copy of the scooter survey reports, and one, one bit of interesting information was that um, the vast majority of people, when asked if they had or had not noticed 
the dismount zone um, signage, 61.5% said no, they hadn't noticed it. So the communication failure on that is on us. Um, you know, clearly we haven't done an adequate job of um, communicating where the dismount zone is or what a dismount zone is. So I think that that's certainly a challenge um, that's on us. Okay, before we get back to the second round of, of council member questions, are there any council members who haven't yet asked a question who would like to ask one? Council member Volan. Thank you, yes. Um, I have a number, I'll just go at random here. Um, isn't private ownership of a motorized scooter legal now? And aren't we talking strictly about the emergence of shared use scooters here. I mean, if I own one of these scooters and want to go around town in the street, I mean, it's, that's not illegal, is it? No, that's exactly right. If you want to go ahead and use a, a, a privately owned motorized scooter in the street, that's totally permitted. Now, when it comes to using it in the sidewalks uh, or using it in a particular way, we can impose regulations on privately, this body can impose regulations on privately owned scooters, just like you do with privately owned bicycles. Uh, on the same note, um, one thing I noticed that was lacking in the definition of a motorized scooter was uh, it seems the difference between that and a bicycle is the pedals. Like a scooter, something that doesn't have pedals. Would it be a problem to include uh, a clause that says that uh, a motorized scooter doesn't have them? So that, that's easier to distinguish from a bike if it says that. Yeah, I, I think that would, uh, there are more than one. There's more than one way to do this. I think that would absolutely be an effective way to distinguish a motorized scooter from a bicycle as well, yes. Part of the reason I ask is because it's probably inevitable that we're going to see hoverboards become a thing, and they are basically battery-powered sk skateboards. So, you know, I mean, the lack of pedals on that, too, makes it more of a coaster or a motorized. I mean, it's not a scooter doesn't have the handlebar. So, um, but that's, yeah, I mean, and frankly, I'm expecting jet-powered skates any day, too. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I have more questions. I'll hold them. Thank and you. I think that's a good point. Just to elaborate, I think you know when yeah. we def when this body defined bicycle. I don't think you had motorized scooters in mind or motorized skateboards in mind. But right. You sort of captured those devices inadvertently when they became a thing uh, in reality. Thank you. So uh, before we go for a second round for council member questions, I had a, a couple of questions, or at least one question, and it's actually for council member Volan. And I'm wondering if uh, in his Peer cities, uh, college-driven metros, uh, work. That uh, you're aware of other cities very much like Bloomington um, that are farther down the road on this issue than we are. What their experience has been, what their, what how they regulate. Uh, you know, if we can uh, make compare, we like to make comparisons in a lot of situations to Bloomington and these other kinds of communities. Um, why not look hard at, at, at their experience with these? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, but I think the answer is, and I can testify to how much work has been put in by the administration on this issue. Um, it's a technology that has really emerged in the past year. Uh, while um, it makes sense for us to compare ourselves to cities that are about our size, um, there, there isn't really, I mean, Mr. Rooker might be able to speak more to this than me, but uh, I want to say the city that we uh, looked at the most closely was Santa Monica. Is that right? Um, and uh, it was mainly because they had, they were just farther along in writing ordinance. I mean, everyone is, is coasting in the dark here, you might say. So, uh, Mr. Rooker, if you can elaborate on this, I would say that you're probably more knowledgeable about the state of code in other cities than, than I am. Yeah, you know, I, I think that your point is well taken, Council Member Volan, that this is so new. You know, I know when, when we sat down with PT, the National Association of City Transportation Officials guidance is brand new. You know, it's yeah. hot off the presses. The IMLA guidance is hot off the presses, and everybody's figuring this out all at the same time. Uh, so, it, you know, it's one of those things where it's inevitable that this is a learn as you go to some extent uh, situation. I think that's right. So, so I guess, again, I would, I would summarize it just by saying that. Um, we, we did not look at, uh, at college metros sp specifically, uh, mostly because we had trouble finding anyone who had definitively put out code that was um, you know, not causing uh, further problems. So I would say Santa Monica was our, was our uh, guiding light in this case. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Volwin. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll go second round questions. We started with Councilman Rallo, and he's had his hand up for a while, so. Thank you. Um, I, I have two. Could I issue two questions? One is um, the, the code, I, I agree with a lot of it, although I, I'm not certain about them being on sidewalks. Um, because I think sidewalks are for pedestrians, and I felt, felt that way about bikes as well. And I, and I actually witnessed a terrible accident between a bicyclist and a pedestrian once, and I'll never forget that. Um, and of course, they present debris on sidewalks and so forth, but it, the code isn't worth anything unless it's enforced. So I think what we're getting at, a number of questions is, and I'm loath to use police time to enforce scooters, um, how much revenue is coming from the scooters that we're driving, and can that be used to hire someone specifically for enforcing scooter, the scooter ordinance? Uh, so the, the short answer to your question is absolutely. Those license fees that are going to be set by the Board of Public Works, they're going to be designed to deal with that precisely. Uh, so if, if somebody does need to, to be hired, right? So if we say at the outset we think, for example, one full-time equivalency is going to be adequate to address some of these issues and we discover the answer is no, it's four, um, those licensing fees are going to be adjusted uh, accordingly. So, so yes. Do you have a number? Of revenue, we are we are you know this is something we're learning about. We have a number of models that are uh, that are out there. There are companies, uh, national companies that perform these services. For example, at least on the parking side, perform services for cities in terms of making sure that scooters aren't inappropriately located. Uh, I don't have a number at this moment for you. We're continuing continuing to talk about it in terms of uh, enforcing scooter use. Uh, for the moment, as Chief Decoff said, that's the sort of thing that's going to be done by patrol officers uh, when they see it, like all other violations. Okay, that's disappointing. Um, but my other question was about impoundment. So when you impound a scooter, I understand it costs $40 to manufacture a scooter, and, we, and the impoundment fees might add up to hundreds of dollars. What happens if it's simply abandoned? Or, or, or is, the, is the penalty regardless of whether they pick up the scooter. Is that, does that, is that occur? The penalty applies regardless of whether or not the company picks up the scooter. So these are designed as municipal fines. So I can file a complaint in court against the company, even if I have to take the battery out of the scooter, mail it to Atlanta <coughs> to recycle it, because that's the only place we can find to recycle uh, a battery and uh, scrap the rest of the scooter. I can still take the company to court to find them. So. Okay. All right. That's good for now. Thanks. Councilmember Strubaugh. Yeah, one interesting thing about the survey was maybe it was a little comforting, only 9%, although that's still a high number, were injured, had scooter injury-related, injury scooter-related injuries. But then when you look on the next page, the polling people were 80% did not, had never ridden a scooter. So 18% had ridden a scooter, 9% had been injured by riding a scooter, which is a pretty high number out of a small selection. Um, would you like to speak to that? And did you find any more information about local injury data from the hospital so related to a scooter? So we do have folks here from the hospital who I think are looking forward to commenting this evening. So oh, it's okay, I'd like to time. leave that to them. But I would point out that the question in the survey is phrased in such a way that it applies both to scooter riders and non-scooter riders, that nine something percent that you're referring to, because we wanted to phrase it in such a way that if you were a pedestrian and had been injured by a scooter, you could still answer affirmatively that you had in fact been in, involved in a scooter <coughs> accident. Well, that's interesting, but it's a pretty high percentage of people that were involved with scooter injury, it seems to me. And I just wonder how much we'll be able to train and educate scooter riders with a couple of these sessions a year. And we've got new people coming. We got tourists. We got new students every year. We got people visiting. Um, nobody will know. I mean, it took, a, it took us half an hour to hear the regulations. Mm -hmm. These people aren't going to have any idea what the rules are unless there's someone out there watching and monitoring and educating and coaching. And I, I've envisioned someone 
on a scooter supplied by the scooter company out there among the scooter people and educating people as it, as it comes. And I think that would be a, maybe a very effective way to both educate in a positive way and report and, and educate in a negative way when things don't get okay. dealt, dealt with right. Councilmember Strebaum, this uh, is turning into, I think, a little bit of editorializing and, and, no, and final comment rather than questioning. No, I was, I was asking a, about more injuries and the injury level and the well, level of education. Okay, well, I, I, so here's I, a question. I understand, and I, Councilor Strom, I appreciate it in the future if, if um, in, and then don't elaborate so much on what you think might happen or what should, just kind of try to get to the question. So that's it, so please continue. Well, I would have liked to hear if we had more statistics about how many injuries there'd been, because the, I read a small article that had nationally there'd been only four deaths, which isn't that many, but lots of head injuries lots of small extremity injuries. And that's, we, I'm surprised that we can't get local data about what's happened to people who are riding these because not, at some level we're responsible too when we just don't make enough rules to make them safe and let them be out there. So that's part of our, our job. Have I asked a question yet? Not no, yet. Mrs. Sturban, we're still okay. waiting for the question. My parking question, well no, I did say why can't we get more data? Why can't we get more data? Well, we, um, there is no uniform <laughs> reporting standard at this time. So um, they're just, that data, the last time we spoke, uh, would, there was no uniform way to report that. Right. So until we're, everybody's talking oranges and oranges, um, we, well, we just don't so have. Well, we're so data driven, we should be able to get data of who gets injured on these scooters, seems to me. Question, Mr. Sturbaum? Yeah, okay. that was a question. Um, so, so, so the question is, why, I guess, why can't we get more data? That's my question. I, th I think the, the answer to the question is the, the data isn't being collected in a fashion right now that would be useful. Thank okay. you. Um, Councilmember Chopra? Yes, I have a question, <laughs> and it is, uh, what got us to arrive at the 18-year sort of age limitation on the scooters? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so that's a requirement that is already being imposed by one of the scooter companies. Uh, if you want to use a shared use motorized scooter, it doesn't apply to privately owned scooters at all. Um, but but that's, uh, it's really a concern about, I think, safety and having people who are using these things responsibly. Um, so obviously the, the older the user, the, the lower the risk factors for irresponsible use. Okay. Um, and my second and final question is, um, what is, uh, what's the result if a user doesn't take a photo at the end of their ride as required? Yeah, so if the, if scooter companies aren't permitting or aren't requiring that to happen in order to conclude the ride so that you stop getting charged for the ride, uh, then the remedy would be to penalize the scooter company in, a, in the form of a fine for noncompliance with, uh, with, uh, with the ordinance. Got it. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Sims. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And if I may, can I invite the medical folks that are here up to the podium? And for the <coughs> record, my question is, what would your injury data suggest to us? Sure. Um, so I have a statement. I don't know if you want me to read the statement I was going to read, and then I can answer specifically need if you just want first. me to answer the data name? question. Could you, could you state, oh, I'm sorry. State your name, I'm, please. I'm Beth Roop. I'm a physician at the um, Indiana University Health Center on campus, and I'm the medical director there as well. well. Thank you. Now let me ask uh, Councilmember Volan, our, our parliamentarian, w is it appropriate for her to make the statement, the written statement, during council or during public comment or not? What do you think? Um, it's in. Our tradition, our norm has been that um, we have a certain set of people who are invited to present. Um, I mean, I don't think it's inappropriate at all that they uh, present at the same time. We didn't uh, call for them in the, um, in the agenda that they would be expected to speak. So normally they would be speaking during public comment, but uh, I think it's a matter for the chair to decide. All right, well, go ahead and uh, make your uh, statement prepared and okay. also respond to the question too. Okay. Thank you. Um, so like I said, I, I serve the campus community, so I'm seeing only students. So my data will also be skewed towards the students who are the majority of the people, or I, I believe the majority of the users of the scooters. Um, but my medical staff and I are very concerned about the dangers of the scooters. 
Um, ever since they arrived this fall, we have seen an increase in injuries related to their use. In October alone, we saw more than 38 patients with scooter-related injuries just in our clinic. Some of the injuries were mild, but others have been more severe, like head injuries, facial fractures, and extremity fractures, some of which required surgery to repair. These injuries can be costly and very disruptive to, college, to a college student. These medical visits and procedures related to scooter injuries can eventually increase overall health care costs for everyone. <coughs> After seeing the dangers these scooters um, posed, I decided we need to be more vocal as medical providers about the scooters. And I, along with Dr. Bob Adams, who couldn't be here tonight, um, the medical director of IU Health Bloomington Emergency Department, uh, requested a meeting with Mayor Hamilton, which we met with him, um, as well as other members of his staff that are here tonight, um, to discuss our concerns and give them our data at that point. Um, we're very concerned that these scooters are making Bloomington and specifically the IU campus less safe. The dangers extend beyond just the person riding the scooter, but also the pedestrians that are being hit, to drivers that are trying to avoid scooter accidents, and to people tripping over scooters left on walkways. The Centers for Disease Control has been investigating scooter use in Austin, Texas, and their report is anticipated any time. It just says this spring, so I'm not sure when it's coming out, but I do think this report will be very helpful to communities that are struggling with this issue. One thing we at the Health Center felt was necessary to do on campus was to engage our campus partners to create a Scooter Safety Week, um, which was a social media campaign that we ran at the end of March to try to help our students to educate them on um, safe scooter use that also included a helmet giveaway to students because I have never seen a student wear a helmet while riding a scooter. Mm -hmm. um, if I had my way, I would totally ban the scooters from Bloomington altogether. Um, but if the city allows them to operate, I would advise more restrictions, many of which were mentioned tonight, but they need to be enforced, and I'm worried that those won't be enforced. Um, so that's all for my statement. Um, as far as data, so as Mary Catherine said, um, we don't have data. I, I can only give you my data from the health center, and we've been just collecting this as patients have come in. We have a walk-in clinic, but we also have appointments. And so my data is only based on students that have just walked into the health center saying I was injured by a scooter. So this is going to be low data because I'm not ca capturing people that have called or made an online appointment. Um, and October was our worst month for scooter use injuries. And like I said, we had 38 people present to our walk-in clinic for scooter injuries. Um, in November, we had 17. In December, we only had nine, but our, our December is shortened with only two weeks of the, um, that month because of finals. Um, so we had 64 that, only, that came to our walk-in clinic in those three months. Now, the um, January, we only had one. Again, it was shortened, but also the birds went away and the limes were intermittent. Um, and then we've had only three in February, and then I don't have data from there, but I anticipate it's gonna go way up in April, again, as it gets warmer and now the birds are back. So that's my data. Um, Dr. Kandel is gonna talk about IU Health, um, but the one thing that he doesn't have that I have, so I used to get all the ER records on IU students. Um, I don't anymore, so I don't have all the data, and that's a whole other complicated matter why I don't see them anymore, but um, I, out of that October, November, and December time, I know 23 IU students were injured um, in the ER that I saw those reports, but I don't get every report on every student that goes to the ER. So again, but with those numbers right there, you can at least get a little bit of a, um, an underestimation of the number of injuries in Bloomington. So I can take any questions, or Dr. Hamill can. M Mr. Chair, could, I, could we have a couple questions? I, I, yeah, sure. I, I don't think Council Member Sims is necessarily finished yet. Well, uh, would, Mr. It, would it be more appropriate? Mr. Chair, let me just say parliamentarily that um, any member can request that the doctors, that they can make questions of, the, you know, address questions to the doctors. But for the moment, Mr. Sims has the floor and he can call anybody else he wants to speak. So we should reserve that. Well, Thank you, Mr. Parliamentarian. But Mr. But Mr. So, Chair, do you think it'd be better for to come in public comments? I just want to hear the data that they have. Um, not uh, necessarily an analysis per se, but uh, uh, yeah, I think we. I'd like to hear the data too. Okay. Uh, good evening. My name is Stan Handel. I am the chief medical officer for IU Health Bloomington Hospital, and more pertinent to this conversation, a practicing emergency physician in in the emergency department here at Bloomington. Am I a little closer? Okay. Um, the, 
Back to your previous question about difficulty in getting, getting data, the way we code um, visits to the emergency department is not based on mechanism of an injury, but the injury itself. So um, we see over 50,000 visits in our emergency department. So I can tell you all the injuries we've had, but whether or not they were scooter caused or not is a little harder to dig into. And actually, to your point, that was one of the early questions I started asking early on. Um, I can tell you anecdotally um, that we have seen an uptick, and there's actually, even in the brief tenure of scooters being in existence in this country, there's already papers coming out in the medical literature, and I'm more than happy to pull those at the request of the council. Um, for review afterwards. Um, I, I think given the speed of these um, vehicles, given the volume of their use, and also the complete lack of familiarity of their users, um, the NG severity that we're seeing is significant. And um, to the point where us as a level three trauma center have on multiple occasions had to transfer patients up to Methodist as the level one trauma center. So I think that the severity and potential injuries <coughs> cannot be understated. Um, Things like skull fractures, um, significant injuries to the abdominal organs um, have been seen on a recurrent basis. So, um, so while we can't give you absolute numbers of what is caused from a scooter specifically, um, if you ask any of my colleagues, including Dr. Adams, we can tell you that there is significant injury and that the volume has increased dramatically since their introduction. Th thank you very much. Um, Councilmember Sims, are you finished with this round of questions for now? Uh, we're going to come around a third time, I think, too. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes. Um, I uh, I want to know how many scooters were allowed under the interim agreements with um, Bird, Lime, and what was the last one? The one we just spin. Thank you. So the agreements do not set caps on the scooters. Mm -hmm. That's dictated uh, by the marketplace. So. That's dictated by what? By the marketplace, excuse oh. me. So. Um, since that was such a short question, may I ask another one? Yeah, yeah please go ahead. <laughs> so um, this is a, a, technical questions about, a que technical question about the scooters. I don't know if it's possible to do this, but I know that when I um, you know, see people trying the scooters for the first time, and when I myself tried the scooters for the first time, um, you know, you just kind of click through and say, okay, yeah, I've read the rules. And nobody actually reads the rules. So is it possible to have for the first time a user uses the equipment, to have a time delay between when they activate it and when it actually works so that they would be they would either be standing around or they would actually read and have be, be forced to take time to actually read the agreement. Um, is that a possibility? I'm just trying to figure out some way to make sure that people actually do read the rules. I think that's a fascinating question and I am definitely not the right person to answer it. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, maybe Mr. Van Deventer, do you know? Would you please come to the podium and, and, and uh, just again, say your name. Every, not everybody's been doing that tonight, but go ahead and My name is David Van Deventer. Uh, I don't know if that exists at this point in time. We are working on other technologies that will include like anti-wobble and stuff like that. So if someone were to get on and be a little more wobbly than we'd like them to be, that the ride will terminate. Um, that's in the works with our next generation scooters that we have coming out. But uh -huh. while you're up there, so the way it works currently, um, how does somebody sign up and use a scooter for the first time? Can you just walk us through that briefly? Yeah, so they uh, will download the app, and then they will have to register, and then they have to go through a user agreement, and then I'm not and sure And they exactly. do all that online, not at the scooter. They do that before? Uh, I don't know if they can do it online or if it's just through the app. Sorry, I don't know that. Um, but currently they have to go through like a series of slides. Um, those are not timed to my knowledge, but I can mention that as a, an idea. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Sandberg. 
Thank you. My question has to do with the problems we're having with the dismount zones, especially in light of the information that we're getting now about injuries and injury data. I think uh, I share Councilmember Piedmont Smith's desire to know as much as we can about where are these injuries happening? Are they happening more on campus where it's crowded with, you know, IU student pedestrian traffic? Or are they happening more in the downtown with the congestion? So that's one thing I want to know. The other thing I want to know is with our dismount zones, as we examine where some of the problems are with collisions and pedestrian dangers, can we expand that dismount zone? If people don't understand what it is, can we better visualize it? Can we make it bigger and just say in the downtown core where urban stuff is happening, no can do. Be in the street but not on the sidewalk. Or, you know, do we need to take a similar look at IU and see where maybe the majority of these injuries are occurring, where we have to be a little tougher with where they're just not allowed on the sidewalk? So I would note that Indiana University has the option of banning scooters on their property. They have not chosen to do so. Um, they do strictly regulate where they are and are not allowed to park, but again, they have not banned scooter usage. <coughs> on their property. Um, as far as exact location of in, um, injuries, I don't have that. I don't know if our health care providers they have that information, so I'm sorry. Um, that's just not information I can provide. But that would certainly be helpful. I'm be sure really you'll agree. It would with, be really interesting. Is this dismount zone enough to, to prevent the, the pedestrian and, and the rider injuries? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, Mr. Brooker, in your presentation, you noted that the Board uh, of Public Works may establish limits on numbers of scooters. Uh, something about limits on the number of scooters may, de may be deployed. So the Board may do it, but then in our um, written packet, it said, the, you, it stated that the Board will cap the number of scooters the company may deploy. So. I'm confused, and then in the question and answer, I believe Ms. Um, uh, Carmichael, sorry, I just want to say Mary Catherine, uh, noted that we're leaving that up to the company. So I'm, I'm just looking for clarification in this. I should be more careful with my verbs, so I apologize <laughs> for the confusion on that. Uh, it is it not, was, it's Isabel's fault, but go ahead. <laughs> it is not a manda it's not mandatory that they set caps. The ordinance grants the board the authority to cap the number of scooters that scooter companies can deploy, but it's not something that they have to do. So, uh, so it, is, it is optional. At this time, I don't know that there would be a recommendation to the board to set any caps uh, until we have a little bit more information and until we know how many scooter companies are going to be operating in the market uh, for sure. But that is something the board has the option to do. So when you were talking with SPIN, you just said drop off what you want? Well, with SPIN, all we did was we, we used the interim operating agreement, the same agreement that's in place with Bird and Lime, so that we could be consistent with all of our companies. And that agreement doesn't set caps. OK. All right, thank you. <coughs> Councilor Golden. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, if someone hires a scooter at exactly 10 p.m., uh, will they be able to operate it until they get to their destination, or will it be turned off at 10.01? Could it be turned off while someone is navigating an intersection, for example? What will happen? The short answer is no. Uh, we obviously don't want a scooter to turn off mid-ride, so there would be a quote unquote run out period where if you rented a scooter just before uh, the scooters are required to be turned off, you would be able to complete that ride. Okay, that's good to know. Um, secondly, um, does anyone in the administration have any concerns about MDS? Now this is the mobility data standard that Los Angeles has pioneered, but the concern is that uh, it is not the hardest thing in the world to identify an individual from ride data any more than it is to crack a poorly chosen password these days. Um, do we have any concern about who has access to um, the scooter data and how, like, are there any safeguards in place? Uh, can you speak on the current state of safeguards 
of that kind of data within the administration? So we are getting some data already as, as part of the interim operating agreements that we have from these companies, and we do very closely guard which individuals in the city are able to see that data. Um, because this is so new, uh, we do want to stick with that particular specification in terms of the, the way we're going to get data. We're going to examine what we get, and if we have concerns about uh, PII, obviously we're going to take those into account, and we'll continue to work with the scooter companies and internally with ITS and uh, with other folks around the city to make sure that we are safeguarding all of those, all of those, uh, all of that information. Thank you. Are there any other second round? Questions from council members that haven't had a second. You should answer. Um, uh, no. Uh, well, um, I actually had a yeah a question for uh, probably Ms. Rosenbarger again. Yep. So, um, is there data? This is first is about bikes. First of all. Is there data out there, not Bloomington specific, but sort of general research uh, and data that, in, that tells us about the demographic income and um, ethnic makeup of, of people who use bicycles for actual transportation as opposed to recreation? Sure, so there's, um, Beth Rosenberger, I don't know if I have to state it every time. Um, <laughs> There is data, so I don't have it like with me, that does show um, out of the lowest income groups, that's the highest group that uses bicycling as transportation. They use it as higher at higher rates than other income groups. Um, typically, we actually see it in lower income and higher income and less in the middle. Um, but yes, in our country, low income also disproportionately impacts minority residents and people of color. So. Is that the question? Yeah, that's the question, but then I want to jump in. I just wanted to make sure I had that right, first of all, so thank you for confirming that. Second of all, is there any indication that this also goes for scooters? That's, that's really my question after confirming the first part. I don't have that, I don't have that data. Yeah, I don't know. Or I, haven't, I haven't seen a study on it or anything either. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, third round questions. We might as well go back the way we started. Councilman Morello. This is for the physicians, um, if you wouldn't mind. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about what you've observed. Uh, specifically, what proportion of injuries of scooter related that are scooter related are of pedestrians as opposed to the riders of the scooters? And then, are they do, overall? Do you see that there you have a greater number than you would say for bicycles? So my name is Beth Roop. Again, I'm with IU Health Center on campus. Um, I would say the majority of the injuries we've seen have been scooter riders, and very few pedestrians hit by scooters. I don't, I, I don't have the breakdown on that. Um, and I would say it, the scooter numbers are so far above what we see with bike injuries. Um, it, I, October was so notable with how many people came in, and we don't see. I mean, we might see a handful of bike injuries a month, but not you know, 30 plus in a month. So it's, it's very different. So tenfold, maybe, you yeah. think? Yes. More than with bicycle. At least in October. Injuries. I mean, my numbers did change as it got colder. So, um, but October, it was pretty significantly different. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, Daniel Dell, Bloomington. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah please. Oh, okay. No, I was, I was going to say that our numbers support um, what was mentioned from, the, from campus, that just because of the speed, of these devices compared to the typical riding speed of a, a recreational bicyclist, um, the mechanism. But it's been mostly the riders themselves and not pedestrians. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Chopra, you had your hand up. Yes, I understand that there is uh, some parking limitations on IU's campus. I think Ms. Carmichael spoke to that. Um, and I totally understand if you can't answer this question, but I wanted to pose it anyway. Um, what are they doing? How is it being enforced? How well is it working? Um, just an overview on their policies and procedures, please. Uh, good evening. Adam Wason, Public Works Director. Uh, glad to be here this evening. Um, so my understanding in conversations with staff at IU is um, 
that they would need to be parked like a bicycle at a bike rack, um, and that, that's what is allowed for parking. If it's left anywhere but at a bike rack, um, and I know in the, in the fall, and I, I, I believe still here in the spring, they've been impounding any scooter that's not at a bike rack. Um, and uh, that uh, happened in a significant number of cases last fall. I do know that. Who is they? Uh, Indiana University. So, in particular, I've been speaking with their parking services director, who's been who was last fall tasked with a lot of these things. Okay. So, have they uh, hired additional personnel to? I believe they were just using their facilities uh, personnel. Um, you know, so maybe like their landscape crews or those facilities folks that are out and about on a regular basis. That's certainly my understanding from last fall. And uh, have the IU staff um, presented to you that it? seemed effective and efficient? Uh, I, I don't know or if I would make that claim. I do know um, <laughs> the numbers of scooters that were impounded by Indiana University staff last fall was pretty staggering, and I do believe there was some um, financial compensation given to IU for the release of those scooters, just like our impoundment fees and our, as they're proposed in this ordinance. Thank you. Um, Council Member Sturbaum. <laughs> Yeah, this would be for Ms. Rosenbarger. I wonder if you would speculate on the relative greenness of walking, biking, and scooters, and then the relative safety of walking, biking, and scooters. Uh, relative to? Safe, relative greenness. <laughs> and the relative safety. Sure, walking is the greenest. Mm -hmm. uh, bicycling <laughs> is second and scooters are third. Um, I think there are lots of comparisons and scooters still use energy, but the fraction of energy required to, if you compare the energy required to move a person on a scooter compared with moving a person in a car, it is a fraction of the energy required. So while it does involve energy, it is much more energy efficient in that comparison. And then a follow up, do you think the scooters are why the bike shares failed and are leaving? Do you think there could be a relationship between those two transportation devices? I think there could be a relationship. I think we also needed, we could learn something from the scooters, which is they did saturate the market. And we saw that uh, for good and bad, but with the bike share, we didn't get to see that. And so while they weren't as easy for people to access, I think. I think there was something easy about checking them out, and there's something very familiar about bicycling, so it is effective, but we don't have data to show if those were the same user groups, honestly. Were the same people, did they stop bike sharing and switch to that, or is the barrier to renting a scooter just a lot lower, so more people did it? Right. I can add on, too, that I would say, well, you asked safety, I don't know how much you want to know from me, but uh, they're all challenging modes because of infrastructure. So we want to improve safety for all of those modes. The U.S. right now has the, um, we've been continuing to increase as a country. This is not Bloomington specific, but pedestrian deaths are like the highest they've been in a decade. So there's a lot we would like to be doing with our infrastructure to improve that. Um, those are pedestrians overwhelmingly hit by drivers. Um, but um, so there are safety gains to make across the board, I think. Thank you. Okay, okay Council Member Sims, then Council Member Granger. Thank you. Um, I don't know who this is for, probably Mr. Rooker. Um, back to enforcement, and, and obviously it's $10 a day up to 180, do, uh, 180 days before it's impounded. And then it's a $150 fee if we impound that. What happens to that 1800 bucks that was charged for storage? Is that part of everything? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I so, didn't hear I didn't hear they were connected. So, so I'm just so if we have to use a municipal facility yes. for storing your scooter instead of using it for what other whatever other purpose we would normally want to use it for, yes, we're we're going to bill you those. I'm going to fine you for those storage fees. I say I because it, it'll probably be me literally. So. Okay, so we'll bill them. Okay. A absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Granger. Oh, did you have anything? Well, I did, but yeah. Well, I just have one more, and this has to do with the, um, and I don't know who would answer this, um, but the affordability, the 50% discount. Um, and Ms. Rosenberger clearly stated that the lower socioeconomic folks are disproportionately made up by minorities. I think that's pretty clear. Um, but to get the 50% discount, they had to meet federal, state, or local assistance program guidelines. And, and that may be somewhat easy to document, but how does that get to these scooter companies? I mean, how do, how do they know when you do, you know what I'm saying, even if Board of Public Works verifies that, then how does that get from there to here so that it actually gets to the, the citizens that we're trying to help most? So I think that's an outstanding question. We had the same question, how does this work in practice, right? How do we make it yes. actually happen? And you know, Lyme, I know, I, I can't speak to Bird and their representatives aren't here, but they have a program very much like this already. So you can log onto their website, you can demonstrate with appropriate documentation, which is not too difficult to provide, that you are participating in an eligible program. Once you do that, you can, uh, you can transfer that to whatever the application would be on your phone, and at that point you're eligible for the discount. I don't know if you want to speak more, more to that. I think oh. that's called, oh. called Lime Access. So there are programs like this that the companies are either doing because they've been required to do it in other communities already, or they're just doing it of their own volition. So okay. I think uh, the, that answers the infrastructure is in place. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Granger, then I think maybe we'll go to the public for comment. Oh, oh Councilmember Piedmont Smith, sorry. Councilmember Granger. Um, thank you. M my question is actually for Mr. Vantadeter. If, if you could step to the podium, please. Um, David Van Evener. Could you say your name slowly, please? <laughs> David Van Deventer. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. No Wrong worries. accent. No worries. Um, our, this uh, legislation says that scooters must be equipped with a bell or horn. Mm -hmm. Are Lime scooters currently equipped? yes um, and what is it sometimes they get broke off when people knock them over and stuff like that and then we replace those as they come in for repairs so it's a <coughs> bell or a horn what is it's it? a bell it is yeah. and it's it's not super effective honestly i usually uh, choose to say on your left or something to that effect but even then people are walking around with headphones sure. so just Try to. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Right. Councilman Piedmont Smith. <laughs> yes, I wanted to ask about a couple of um, ideas that were brought to me by a constituent. Um, the scooter boxes that are proposed to be, you know, drawn on the pavement as a parking area. Um, would it be possible to have helmets available there to have some kind of cabinet where you could you know use your phone to open it and borrow a helmet and then return it because I'm very concerned about all these people not wearing helmets that is a, a really great question and that is not one that's come up we've we've talked about scooters for a, a lot of hours and that's not one that we've batted around really uh, so so let us think about that a little bit and see if uh, see if there's a model that might work for something like that okay um, and then my other question is, uh, will scooter symbols be added to bike lanes so that people know that bike lanes are also appropriate for scooters? Um, good question. We haven't really, Adam Wason again, Public Works. Um, you know, that hasn't really been discussed in our internal conversations. Um, you know, we have miles upon miles upon miles of bike lanes throughout the city. Um, obviously, if you know, if we are recouping all of our costs, it's something we could do. Um, but again, we haven't discussed that internally. Um, uh, so, I guess that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilmember Volan. Then we're going to go to the public. I think. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, is there going to be? This is maybe a kind of administrative question. 
Is there going to be a scooter web page on the city site? I'm going to sneeze now. Uh, where the agreements the city has with the various companies are published, along with the schedule of rates and charges, and the required phone numbers. Uh, like, it, would, could it be bloomington.in.gov slash scooters? Could we have a page that just has all that info on it? Um, I can see why, no reason why there wouldn't be. I, I mean, just, we're, we're constantly pushing out information as it comes in, and, and that seems like appropriate information to share with the public. Yeah. I, there, I don't know that we'd keep up with each company's rates uh, necessarily. <coughs> um, well, I mean, if there was just a link on the page to where someone could see what their rates are, oh, sure. it wouldn't be a, a, an unreasonable thing to maintain. Absolutely. Um, it's just that if there isn't one uh, <coughs> catch point for all that information, it's effectively not published. Sure. Okay. Um, is there any concern, I don't know if this question is for you, Ms. Carmichael, but uh, is there any concern about yellow curb spaces as parking for scooters? Um, I think it's actually a pretty good idea, but I'm wondering what, uh, okay. how you'll implement that. Yeah, so um, uh, Council Member Volan, I, I would compare it a lot to um, the way the Pace Bike Share was implemented. We used a lot of yellow curb areas for parking for the Pace Bike Share. Uh, and the reason that they are deemed safe for that purpose is they don't create line of sight issues. Um, so the scooters aren't, they're small, they're not very, you know, they're not boxy or anything else, actually blocking a line of sight from a driver of a vehicle. So uh, we don't have much concern with that. You know, there may be some areas that we wouldn't based on maybe, um, uh, you know, turn radius or, yeah. So. Uh, you've, you've answered my question well. That, that satisfies me. Thank you. Um, is there a penalty? Yes. I think, just to add on, I'm sorry, I think, I couldn't tell if you interpreted that we would say any yellow curb no, compared I don't with, think so. okay. Yeah, just Second. some. Just yeah, some. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. No, I think it's a good use of yellow curb space. That, and that was Ms. Rosa Marger. Yes. Um, is there, what is the penalty for a scooter company when the rider doesn't bother to take the picture that shows they parked it properly? So maybe I didn't communicate this as clearly as I meant to earlier. The idea is that you can't conclude your ride until you take an appropriate picture uh, demonstrating where you've located where you've located that scooter which would mean you'd continue to be charged so that would be part of ending your ride if the scooter company does not require that as a term of renting a scooter from that scooter company we would impose that general penalty against the scooter company for non-compliance which is twenty five hundred dollars per violation per so, violation so that's a pretty hefty fine so if uh, an unrelated pedestrian comes by and shoves a scooter over uh, what kind of penalty does the company might the penalty might the company experience? Yeah, and I think you've identified one of one of those problems. There's all sorts of intervening uh, causes that could could do that. Even the wind, right? If we see a big wind event, could blow a scooter over. So that's one of those situations where probably relocation would absolutely be one of the remedies we would use with our staff, and then potentially a fine as well. Um, but we, you know, anytime we think about imposing a municipal fine against a company or an individual, just to be clear, we try to be fair about that and take intervening causes into account. Thank you. Uh, in addition, how will a ticket be enforced? Will it be on the company until it gets passed to the rider by the company? In other words, if, if they don't specify who got the ticket, then the company pays it. For parking violations, yes. Okay. And, okay. Uh, for, last for question. For violations, obviously, it's, it's yeah, different. Last, last question for Mr. Van Dievender. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Rooker. Um, when Lime scooters get impounded, how quickly does Lime re react to it here in town? And what kind of data do you have about how many scooters you've lost to because you didn't collect them? Okay. Uh, David Van Evender. Um, so how fast do we respond? As quickly as possible. Um, with the impound, we've been working very closely with Amanda Turnipseed, the Director of Parking Operations at IU, and Tyler Easton. Um, the delay in us getting our scooters from impound there has been in the um, transfer of information from the facilities to the parking operations to issue a citation and then contacting us. Well, then typically, just how long does it take you to get your scooters back? Um, once we know about the citation, less than a week. Uh, how many have you not known about? Um, quite a few. <laughs> okay, so are there still yeah, some in impact like right from now? December through January, I never received any citations from IU, but they had continued to impound. Um, once we found out about those, we made every effort to pay them as quickly as possible. Okay, uh, how many Lime scooters are currently impounded right now that you know of? Um, to my knowledge, zero. 
Okay, thank you. That's it for my questions. All right, thank you. We're ready to go to the public for public comment on this. Um, so please just approach the podium, state your name. Um, is there a sign-in sheet up there? Yeah, sign in, if you don't mind. Hello, I'm Christine Missick. I will be 62 years old this year, and I have been riding scooters in Bloomington for seven years, six or seven years, almost daily in the good weather. So I think that makes me one of the people in this area who has the most actual riding experience. I absolutely adore them. I have two privately owned scooters. One is a kick scooter operated by my foot, and the second is an electric one. I have to say I'm not able to ride a bicycle because of bad knees, but I find either scooter perfectly easy and, in fact, preferable to a bicycle. And, and I, I, this is just my opinion. I suspect that the pay bicycles have sort of gone down while the scooters have become popular because they are really a joy to ride. The, uh, I want to address the group because I had a couple of concerns about the rule about sidewalks, which seems to me impractical. Um, I do want to say, though, that in those six or seven years of my riding a scooter, I have never been in an accident. But I am an older person who rides it safely, just like younger people are more likely to be in car accidents. Um, when I ride a scooter on a sidewalk, if I'm approaching a pedestrian, I slow down to about the speed of a pedestrian. Scooters are more stable than bicycles. I could ride a scooter at maybe a quarter of the speed that a pedestrian is walking without losing my balance. So pedestrians are not concerned about me. Somebody waiting for a bus stop, for example, or walking on the street to see me coming, it's not a worry. They might be perfectly content to stay in the middle of the sidewalk. So what am I to do? Go on the, somebody's lawn. <laughs> if I dismount, I'm not only annoying myself, but I'm annoying the pedestrian because on my scooter, I was taking up the amount of space that I would take up walking, you know, the width. But if I dismount, all of a sudden I have this bigger width. Um, so I wonder if there might be some way of, uh, figuring a somewhat different rule for sidewalk riding. Myself, I think it's three feet on most sidewalks is really not manageable. Um, I wonder if it might be appropriate to say that you must slow down to pedestrian speed or that in passing a pedestrian you may go only the minimum speed necessary to pass them while you're passing them. Anyway, just the thought. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I really commend the city for allowing bicycles and scooters on the sidewalk. In my experience, most places I ride, I encounter very few pedestrians. And it might be with the survey about people knowing about the dismount zone downtown. The reason that they might not know about it may have nothing to do with, it might just have to do with necessity. These might be people riding their bicycles or scooters in their part of town and don't even ride downtown so they wouldn't happen to see the signs. But I have to say, the, the rule about letting scooters on the sidewalks as well as bicycles, to me is absolutely an essential safety issue because cars kill. I, there, every year people are, die from motor vehicle accidents, and, and I tell you there's nothing more frightening than seeing a car collide with a pedestrian, which I did not all that long ago. Um, so if I come into downtown at the dismount zone, I have two choices. I can walk on the sidewalk, well that's okay, but it takes up a little bit of room, but I tell you I do not want to go in the street because my fear of being hit by a scooter on that sidewalk is minuscule compared to my fear of being hit by a car in the street. So my concern is, I think it's understandable to have that dismount zone downtown, but I hate to see dismount zones expanded too much because what you're doing is encouraging people to ride scooters 
in roads where it's not necessarily safe. And the, the greater likelihood of a death is going to be a car hitting a scooter. It might be the car's fault, and it might be the scooter's fault. Anyway, that's basically what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, other public comment? Uh, good evening, Council. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to speak on this issue. I am a constituent of Council Member Granger out of District 2. And, 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 and my name is Aaron Caleb Crane. I go by Caleb. I come not only speaking for myself, but speaking for a lot of people in the disabled community in dealing with these motorized scooters. They have become a problem and a nuisance, and that's putting it very, very politely. <clears throat> scooters parked on sidewalks, as suggested by the ordinance outside of the dismount zone, present a very big safety risk. Um, that minimum of 54 inches required by the ADA, while it may work for me as a thinner person, the wheelchairs for larger people, such as my mother, are quite wider. And passing a scooter that is sitting on the sidewalk and trying not to fall sideways off of the edge and potentially fracture your skull or worse is very, very difficult. Um, myself, I feel those scooters should not be allowed on the sidewalks, but many people in the disabled community, community we are split. So on that, I can't really speak. Um, I would encourage the council to look at putting those painted boxes around the city, not just in those specific areas like the dismount zone, that would open up the sidewalks for members of myself and others who are vulnerable to this issue, whether it be disabled or elderly who can't move out of the way fast enough. <clears throat> I appreciate what the administration has done in surveying about this issue, but a couple of surveys or a couple of education areas each year is not enough. I took the survey months ago, and there was a, I believe there was a set deadline of like last week where somebody could take some of that data that you have in front of you tonight about injuries with scooters and the way those questions were phrased does not really lend itself to injuries when the scooter is parked or in the way of the sidewalk. I myself last Tuesday obtained a couple major scrapes on the hand and <laughs> broke off and damaged the uh, nail bed of my ring finger on my right hand because I had to maneuver around a scooter and fell out of my motorized wheelchair and my support staff could not catch me in time. So I strongly encourage the council to go back and negotiate with the administration, ban scooters from parking on sidewalks, period. Give them somewhere else. Give them those painted boxes. Find other ways. Extend the sidewalks, if possible, to provide wider areas like the Beeline Trail. Parking on the Beeline is not difficult for people with disabilities to get around, therefore making Bloomington much safer for folks like myself. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, other, other public comment? Hi, I'm Jenny Wilkinson. Um, I live in the Elm Heights neighborhood. Um, what I want to speak to most of all is the, um, the laws that bicycles have to adhere to. Um, I'm a cyclist. Um, I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area, California. Um, out there, bicycles are, tre are just like cars. We have to adhere to all of the motor vehicle um, laws and regulations. Um, I am really adamant about the fact 
that bicycles do not ride on the sidewalk. Um, scooters do not ride on the sidewalk. Um, I, I, there's no place for that with pedestrians on the sidewalks in a downtown district, for instance, our downtown. It's very dangerous. This uh, young man here just spoke to that. Um, I am really passionate about um, having bike lanes, and I think scooters are probably going to be, uh, it's a wonderful idea to have scooters and bikes share, like the bike lane downtown on Walnut and College, you know, going to and fro. Um, that's the appropriate place, in my opinion, for that to be. Um, also on the Beeline Trail, which I walk to the market on the weekends. Um, I ride my bike to the market on the weekends. And I have to say, as a cyclist, um, it would be really great, like we have out on the West Coast, um, to have the Beeline trail, trail twice as wide and have a line down the middle and have a side for moving vehicles, bicycles, scooters, and a side for pedestrians so that there's a clear pathway to um, keep people, because I know even, and I am a cyclist too, and when I'm walking down the Beeline Trail on a, on a market weekend, um, and now we're getting ready, I mean, you know, it's, it's very busy from like Second Street all the way down to the market and back. Uh, to have, to really put some safety in mind there, um, as I ride my bike sometimes, when I, when I do ride my bike, um, to, you know, I wish I had my own lane, actually, to not have to keep saying ding, 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 or on your left, on your left, but to have my own designated uh, lane to um, go on that trail, maybe, you know, make the trail twice as wide as it is, um, and, the, and then have scooter parking on the sides, not actually on the trail, but like those boxes you're that they're, they're speaking about for the parking, um, have little indents, you know, where, where bikes and uh, scooters can park. Um, it's, uh, I have to tell you, in the Elm Heights neighborhood, we're finding them all over the sidewalks. They're in the street. Um, uh, I find them in front of my house on the sidewalk, laying, laying over on the side um, at nighttime. Uh, the lighting is not that great in Elm Heights, uh, street lights. Another thing I want to talk about at one point, actually, um, but not in this meeting. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, the tripping hazard is incredible uh, because of that, the, the lack of street lights. Um, and so I think, you know, I love the, the, uh, the alternative mode of transportation that the scooters provide. However, the management of it is something that uh, is, if it's managed right, I think it will be a great, a great uh, opportunity to, to offer another mode of transportation here. Um, I also have a solar bicycle, which you know, I'm, I'm trying to work on that alter, alternative mode of transportation myself. Um, uh, but I think if we're going to become this town that the mayor says we want to become, and you all are, you know, obviously uh, we have a great city council, thank you guys, uh, to support um, alternative modes of everything, uh, we need to be thoughtful about it and uh, really try to uh, put the public safety first um, and not just let, oh my God, somebody come here and just drop something in our town and nobody knows what to do with it. So um, I'm trusting that you all were, are going to come up with a great solution for that and thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. Anyone else in the public like to speak?
Good evening, council members. My name is Alan Quatterer. Um, I wish to draw your attention to an ongoing lawsuit against the city of San Diego by a disability rights advocacy group. This lawsuit hasn't necessarily been resolved as of yet, but it shows that there is an importance to act on this, um, to put a stake in the ground that might help this, this uh, current setup, this current business that's been growing um, the limes, the, the birds. Um, you, you have a responsibility to help it grow with these regulations, but to help it grow responsibly as well. Um, there's currently a precedent being set, um, and the lack of Bloomington's regulations are, it is possible that the lack of regulations would bring a similar um, lawsuit down upon this city without definitive action. Um, I urge you to get out ahead of what has been said several times this evening, the learning curve of these businesses growing, um, and to, well, get out ahead of it. Um, this would help to protect both the interests of the citizens as well as the businesses uh, that are going to be moving forward. I thank you. Thank you for those comments. My name is Rowan Candy. Um, I have a bit of a physics question that I don't know the answer to. We've talked about in the ordinance, the proposed ordinance, a maximum speed that these sco scooters might have, but I actually care more about the braking capacity. And I know that's not a subtle question because we don't want them to brake too quickly. That will throw people off into dangerous situations. But it feels to me that we need to, I think, um, try to establish that a known braking distance for these scooters and therefore be confident that a rider can stop safely and encourage these companies to look into the engineering, and I know there's many engineers out there, mechanical, electrical, that can actually figure out the damping and the braking process to maximize our opportunity to make these vehicles safe. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if anyone, I don't know if anyone can speak to it, but that was just... It's the slowing down that matters to me. <laughs> Anyone else uh, from the public like to speak? So, so. I just didn't want to take any other places if they were trying to come up here. Yeah, so. Um, has more phone? Shall we have Mr. Van? You have to is anybody else going to speak? What is it? So, so, so uh, um, we generally allow one opportunity for comment. Um, okay. So, I want to address um, parking, which I didn't talk about before, but if, if yeah. Um, if, uh, if you could, uh, well, we'll be meeting again next week, of course, to discuss this to make and to make an actual decision, because tonight's decision, of course, is just a just a committee a recommendation to the full council at a regular session. So you'll have another opportunity. Plus, feel free to, if you stick around and talk to us afterwards, or send an email to council members through the council office. Um, and uh, Mr. Van Dievender, did you have a, a comment? I mean, you, you've answered questions for us, and we appreciate that very much. This is your opportunity to make a, a comment. Yeah, this, so this is my public comment, and I'll be around afterwards if anybody wants to ask me questions out in the lobby. I have business cards and stuff like that. Uh, again, my name is David Van Dievender. Um, as I stated before, in my previous appearance before the council, I was born and raised here in this town. I've lived here, gone through some growing pains as we've gotten a little bigger and downtown's changed quite a bit. Miss Spaceport. <laughs> um, but I wanted to give a little background. Um, so Lime, right here locally, we're encouraged um, as operations managers to kind of own our business. And we are very, very, concerned about safety. Um, my guys that go out and patrol around town, um, they are physically inspecting the scooters as they go around. Um, those people are paid a living wage, by the way. I want to make sure that's known. Um, we also have people who go and collect scooters in the evenings and charge them. Those people are making money. They're reporting to me. They're using it to buy cars. They're using it to take their significant others out for dinners. So it is bringing money into the local economy as well. Um, we are being proactive um, in 
you know, participating in the city street fair to promote uh, safe riding um, and, you know, talk about the environment. Um, I participated um, unsolicited in the helmet giveaway at uh, Indiana University. I uh, just kind of showed up and gave out my own helmets. Uh, we will be giving away helmets at the city street fair. Um, and we will also be dem demoing um, our new scooter with the new technologies and stuff like that in it. Um, I, think. I wanted to say earlier too, people were talking about cars and everything like that. Um, globally, one third of our riders, um, and I know I mentioned this before, but um, are reporting that they are replacing car trips with scooter rides. So they're one out of three people are replacing rides that would otherwise be taken up by personal vehicles, taxis, Ubers, um, or friends dropping people off on 10th Street. Um, um, currently, I have eight people that are working with me. Um, and like I said, those people do make living wages. I wanted to highlight that we have been very responsive um, to any complaints from the city that come from Morgan. Um, she'll text me or email me. Um, I've, she'll forward me the U reports and I can, you know, I have people working typically 24 hours a day and um, we respond very quickly. Um, we've also been very reflexive and responsive and anticipating. Um, so like the lighting of the Christmas lights, at the square, I had my guys pulling people or pulling scooters outside of the event before we were ever asked to. Um, same thing, I've already talked with the people running the city street fair, we'll be doing the same thing there. So we'll be making sure that they aren't in people's way. Um, so I just wanted you to know those are some of the things that we are doing. Um, nearly everything in the ordinance we're already doing, um, plus some in some cases. So. Um, that's kind of it, but I just wanted to, you know, those things, so thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing that with us. Anyone else in the public like to comment at this time? Seeing no more public comment, we'll come back to council, and if, if council members have additional questions for staff or uh, we feel free to go ahead and ask them now. Oh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Um, yeah, I think, uh, Councilmember Volan mentioned that you know we're, we're seeing other modes of non-car non transportation as well, and um, I think he mentioned hoverboards. I have seen on campus the electric skateboards. So our um, in an effort to be proactive, should we also be thinking about electric skateboards or? Are they, how are they currently governed? Can you speak to that, please? Yes, I think that's a great question. You know, uh, I think I sort of half mentioned this before, but the definition right now of bicycle in the city code defines bicycle as including similar motorized devices. So that's also defined as a bicycle, which for the moment is how we've categorized motorized scooters. Now that's not perfectly precise, but for the moment when staff goes to regulate uh, things like electric skateboards, which you will see around town, we use, uh, we apply the same requirements that are applied, the same rules that are applied to bicycles to those electric skateboards. Okay, well that's good to know. So there are some regulations. There are some regulations. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Um, comment, final comment? Seriously? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rollo. Did you? Allison, would you prefer? Okay. All right. Uh, just a couple of observations. One is that I'm really unconvinced that dockless scooters are a positive addition to our community. Um, it certainly hasn't helped matters that the companies chose to dump their product on the community uh, first without, and then ask permission later. Uh, and that was, I think, uh, a great miscalculation. I, I, I don't know about their public relations department, but I think they may want to ask them if this is the appropriate way forward because I'm sure it's received the same sort of response from a number of communities. But apart from that, and I'm also very 
I'm very appreciative that the uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, Van Deventer, is that correct? Uh, came to this evening. I'm very unimpressed that the representative from Byrd chose not to come because this is serious. It involves injuries, uh, involves safety in the community. Uh, I'm very concerned about the number of injuries observed and, and described by the physicians that may be uh, on the order of tenfold greater than bicycles. I think the demographic makeup of our community ensures that those sorts of injuries will probably happen uh, every year because as new students come, they probably will be inexperienced and are prone to, to have those injuries. Um, so perhaps a ban is the best approach. I don't know. I'm still wondering if that's the case. Now, for people who own private scooters, I have nothing against that. I mean, by all means. But I'm talking about these companies that have just simply released them on our community and expect us to sort it out. Um, maybe at least removing them from sidewalks is the way to go that would reduce hazard for pedestrians. I think sidewalks are for pedestrians, frankly. Uh, I have a number of elderly constituents that um, are afraid to use sidewalks at times because of, of the, the hazard. And, um, I, and of course, uh, for people who have various disabilities, um, we go through a great deal of effort to make sidewalks accessible for, for people with disabilities. And I think it's very unfair then to put them in competition with scooters and um, that are many times blocking their, uh, their way and result in injury and so forth. I think that's outrageous, it's appalling actually, um, that people could be so negligent. Um, I'm not sure about enforcement, I'm not sure that whether enforcement is going to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the means by which we go about that and as I said, police have enough to do without uh, ticketing scooters. Now it doesn't mean that one must ride uh, scooters in busy roadways. We have an, enough calm streets in town that they could, they could uh, ride, I think, without uh, you know, having, having a, a, a problems with cars on those streets. Um, I suspect that the dockless bicycles, which I actually liked coming to town and actually went through the process of, of getting permitted, uh, could not compete with the scooters. So uh, I'm, I'm in, in uh, a quandary. Uh, perhaps if we keep them reducing the speed from 15 miles an hour uh, to some lower minimum, ma maximum speed, and we can do that apparently electronically, is the appropriate measure, at least for the time being, which would result in lower in uh, injuries uh, just simply because the momentum of these things would be, would be less. So uh, maybe that's an option. I'm really unsure about how green these things are. I mean, they're charging electricity, which is coal, coal generated at this point. I think most of the scooters are for pleasure trips and or to, uh, to get to a destination faster. It's not, it's not replacing cars. Um, I'm, I'm unconvinced about that. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'll, I'll pass tonight. Um, by the way, 59% of the city survey respondents uh, favored prohibiting e-scooters from sidewalks. So the majority would, would prefer that. Uh, so I take that into account. So at this point, I may be pr producing some, uh, maybe with a cooperation with colleagues, some amendments uh, for regulation. Um, but I'm undecided whether or not they just may need to go completely. Thank you. Councilmember Chopra. Yeah, um, I appreciate Councilmember Rallo's comments about a, a total ban, which um, I think is unfortunate. I like the scooters. I think they're fun. Um, they're enjoyable to ride like a bike. Um, and they're also useful. I've used them for mid-distance uh, trips. Those that are seem too long to walk but silly to get in a car. Um, and I think they're really useful for that. Um, but I don't, my concerns trump that fun and convenience for me. My concerns are mostly what Mr. Crane brought up. I appreciate you coming back because I know that you were here a couple weeks ago. Um, accessibility for people with wheelchairs is my number one concern here. And I, I don't think that this legislation 
will solve that problem. I'm not convinced that it will. Um, you know, I don't think that the scooters should be parked on sidewalks whatsoever, nowhere. But the problem with that is to say, okay, well, you, you put the boxes around. Well, you're never going to have enough boxes, and let me tell you why. Because they're convenient for those mid-distance trips. So if I'm taking a scooter for a quarter or one-mile ride, what it, you think I'm going to walk another quarter mile to find a place to put it? No, I mean, that's why they're fun and convenient, because you can get on them on demand, get off them on demand, and just put them where, you know, wherever. Um, you know, when I use them, I put them in a place that, don't, that is not obstructing others, but I don't think the majority of people are doing that. Um, I, I do understand concerns about safety, but, um, you know, we had an increase. It's, it's the users mostly that are hurting themselves. So um, that to me is, it's unfortunate, uh, but, um, it's not as compelling. So, as much as I had said, I really like the scooters, and I think they're convenient, and they're good, and they're a great idea, I just, I, I don't see this legislation solving any of the problems that we're having. Um, so, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Granger. Thank you. I can say that the scooters look like fun, but I, I have balance issues, so you don't want to see me on a scooter. Um, but I think they do have a purpose in the community, and I think people do enjoy using them for reasons that um, Ms. Chopra mentioned. But I, um, I think this, perhaps this legislation doesn't go far enough. I'm going to be considering some amendments. But m my concerns, um, I'm very concerned about the, the safety. Um, and perhaps the way to mitigate that is to reduce the maximum speed. Uh, that might help. It, uh, if we had, uh, I think Mr. Volan said there were 18% users who responded to the survey, and if 9% uh, have been involved in actual accidents, 9% of the total respondents, that's still half of the users because they were involved in a scooter accident. So that, that just, that really uh, concerns me. Um, I would like to see a committed public safety response to these issues, and that may be increased police officers. I think I've been asking for an increase in numbers for years, and this might be the opportunity we're looking for. Um, the other thing that, that concerns me, um, I visited the Lyme site, Lyme Access, and I think it's great. I mean, I think that we do need to, if we're going to provide this, we need to provide it across the board. But Lyme Access, uh, it, it takes them two days to reply to your request to get a reduced fee. So you won't be taking it to any you know, short midterm ride, and that we need to figure out um, how to make it accessible for people. Um, I am glad that we are thinking about this because this is, I, we, I think we've all had a lot of um, feedback from people um, for the scooters, against the scooters, not on the sidewalks, on the sidewalks. And I think it's, um, if they're going to be here, then we need to figure out ways to regulate them that works for the, for the most of us, that's most effective. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Oh. oh, well, I think Councilmember, if I'm going to go that way, I think Councilmember Sandberg had, her, had a hand up a while back. Thank you. Well, um, I, I certainly want to applaud the administration for addressing the issue, which we've all been struggling with for a while. Um, and as Councilmember Rollo points out, when things are just dropped on us, it forces us to have to scramble to figure out how is the best way forward. And I think this is a good first step. I share some skepticism along with Council Member Rollo 
Uh, I was skeptical about the whole idea of bicycles on sidewalks, especially in crowded areas where there could be you know, negative interactions with pedestrians or individuals with disabilities um, and in wheelchairs. Um, and my understanding is what we have regulated for bikes, we now are forced to agree to for scooters. And so there is some concern about how we make sure that is more appropriately regulated. Um, and again, I, I agree, sidewalks, uh, I, I think, tend to be you know, for people who are walking, which is the greenest form of transportation. Um, so um, again, good first start, like some of the others, I think I will pass tonight, because I would like to see what we might do to perhaps tighten up some amendments. And again, I'm, I'm looking at these three companies, Lime, Bird, and Spin. And I will be looking at the ones that are going to be a part of the solution with us. And I think as we go further down the road, we can tighten this up even more and maybe only allow one of the three to operate uh, if they will be good business citizens of this community and help us. This business of people just leaving them wherever and they fall over and they're in the sidewalk, that cannot stand. I mean, something definitely needs to be done about that. Um, and so there's a lot more I think we're going to need to look at this being a pilot. We're all in a situation that we've never had to deal with before. Uh, it is a good first step, um, but I'm not sure I can vote for it in its complete um, proposal that's presented with us tonight. So I, too, will pass. Thank you. Councilmember Sturbaum. Yeah, I'm thinking of three different options. I think we have to have real enforcement, and I think we'll have to have a full-time person who is assigned just to scooter management, scooter education, scooter enforcement on the street. You know, and that's kind of a cool job. Somebody has to ride around on a scooter and make sure everyone's behaving themselves and it, teaching them of the rules and teaching them of the dangers that they've come here and, and are unsuspectingly ex going to experience. The second option, if I think, if we think that enforcement is simply not going to happen, that we have a bunch of rules, nobody ever reads them, nobody ever wears a helmet, you know, um, sidewalk only is something that is a total option, keeping people off the sidewalks, street only. Um, the state has allowed us to treat electric scooters differently than bicycles. That's recent. And it happened because Indianapolis has banned them from sidewalks. So has Ann Arbor. So has Oklahoma City. Those are two college communities. So has Atlanta and Seattle. And this is just some initial research that's been done by Stacy Jane Rhodes for a, for a council. That is a possibility. But then there's that other danger of then you're in the street and it's even more dangerous. And I don't know how to measure my responsibility or council's responsibility when we sign off on this, but the day is going to come when that, those parents are going to come down and their, their son or daughter have been badly injured or dead because of scooter accident. You know, it's the first week. They got a little drunk. They got on the scooter. We've given it the okay. We've given it the green light with full knowledge that these are dangerous that people are injured on these scooters, that there's a likelihood that someone will be very badly hurt, and people have already been very badly hurt. And I'm hearing from hospital administrators, hospital doctors, we all just heard. And the, you know, sending them up in the helicopter means they're pretty close, they're in real danger. You know, it's lucky that no one's died so far. I think that's a fair statement. So what is the level of our responsibility when we sign off? You know, I don't, I never thought of sitting in this chair and having that kind of responsibility, but maybe we do and we should reflect on that. So I'm still passing. These are three options. Uh, keeping them off sidewalks is better for the community. They can't park. They can't dump them everywhere. They're, the use will probably diminish because it's not as good to ride them on streets. The enforcement will be easier because it's really pass-fail you're on a sidewalk or you're not. You know, all these other rules, you're in the zone, you're not in the zone, you're, you know, so that becomes easier to enforce. Uh, and then there's the, the easy way to have someone who is educating, enforcing, watching, making sure the rules are followed, 
trying to teach safety, trying to encourage helmet use, talking to people when they leave them carelessly on the sidewalk. So I'm going to pass. I don't know which of these three is the best option. Thank you. Councilmember Volan. Uh, I, I want to challenge uh, Councilmember Granger to see who looks clumsier or less balanced on a scooter, her or me. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not very graceful on one, but I have ridden them, and I would uh, ride them um, for practical reasons to get somewhere, as Councilmember Chopra said, where it's somewhere between uh, walking and driving. It's you know, too short to drive, too long to walk. Uh, but I haven't ridden it much. I could be blown over by a strong breeze. Just uh, fair warning, get, get away from me from on a scooter. Uh, cars were disruptive technology. Uh, well, I'm going to come to that. I want to say first, the companies didn't need to seek permission any more than delivery trucks need to seek permission to deliver stuff by double parking on the street. Uh, newspapers didn't need permission to, to chain a box to a post, although we eventually passed rules for that as well. They were putting boxes in the right of way. Uh, the emergent technology that has made this new service possible is not the scooter, which has been around for decades, or the internet, which is a little newer, or mobile phones, although that the mobile phone camera is crucial to the business model of this new uh, industry. It's the battery. It's the battery in your cell phone, which is connected to the internet, and the battery in the scooter, which makes it a viable and innovative form of transportation. We saw shared use bicycles, and they were a dud. People just aren't using them. It's the battery power that has made scooter, scooters go viral in real life. So yeah, cars were disruptive technology back when the square was full of hitching posts, and we needed boardwalks to avoid the mud and the dung from horses in the unpaved streets. The issue here since then has always been about how much we take for granted the privileges that we have allowed cars to possess and retain. The expectation that the street will be clear for them to go 30 or 40 miles an hour, even though the speed limit says 25 or less, uh, in a central urban street. So for someone to say that scooters should be banned, but cars should continue to be able to operate at anything faster than 20 miles an hour is being very hypocritical. This is once again about students. The data we've heard tonight has been anecdotal about injuries, about the survey done by the city. None of it is scientific. It's enough that our concern is justified, uh, it, the, the injuries we've seen, to, and we have acted as uh, the administration has done very good work. They've not been sitting still. The council is taking seriously this issue, but we need to be careful not to pass judgment on data that's not reliable. Uh, uh, Councilmember Sandberg did say the proposal is a good start. I agree with that. And I expect there's going to be a couple of amendments between now and next week. And like we said with much other legislation, we can always fix it in a few months. Uh, I think the television industry uh, line is we can fix it in post. We can always, you know, improve it later. Uh, meanwhile, let's remember that 70% of rides on Bloomington Transit alone are student riders. Without them, without the money that students uh, pay to Bloomington Transit for the transportation fee, we would have one of the worst transport systems in the state of Indiana. Uh, once again, I hear people letting that very, very familiar local bias against students clouding their judgment. The idea of a dismount zone downtown is crazy to me at this point. We wouldn't need a dismount zone if we just slowed car traffic on those same streets. If a driver is afraid of injuring a scooter user, the driver should be more careful, full stop. Maybe they should come to a full stop. I weigh 240 pounds. The typical scooter weighs 25 to 30 pounds. The toaster I drive, a little, I drive a little Nissan Cube, it weighs 2,800 pounds. With me on the scooter versus me in the car, it's more than 10 times greater weight. I have a greater responsibility, and it takes a longer distance for me to stop in that than it does on a scooter. As a city, we do not have to continue endorsing top speed for 3,000 pounds of vehicle. Uh, you know, the, the, why can't we, and when scooters go 15 miles an hour. Uh, the average speed drivers can drive in downtown streets is around 15 miles an hour anyway. Practically speaking, uh, a Bloomington Transit bus can operate at 10 miles an hour when you count all the stops they make and the, uh, the traffic that they incur uh, throughout the city. Uh, 
So if we were to slow down traffic on the roads to 20 miles an hour or less for all traffic, including cars, we could, raise, we could return the ban on bicycles and scooters on sidewalks. Why has nobody thought about that yet? Is it because cars should absolutely continue to have priority? We're living in a new world. If we think scooters are the end of it, we're mistaken. Uh, 100 years ago, that's exactly how fast people traveled. Scooters are basically effectively the new horses. Uh, listen to the phrases we use. We talk about parking meters and parking spaces. We need to rethink our vocabulary. They're car parking spaces. They're car parking meters. We need to have scooter parking now because it's getting in the way because people are living on the sidewalks. But every time we talk about parking and we don't think about all kinds of parking, uh, you know, we're continuing to reinforce the idea that the cars have priority and they should be able to go 30 miles an hour and they kill people at much greater rates than any scooter will much greater rates everywhere. Uh, but, you know, and keep in mind that this ordinance says that parking tickets for scooters will be the same cost as for cars. $30, the double to 60, all right? So scooter drivers are now going to have increased responsibility, much more uh, appropriate to uh, car operators. But this doesn't let scooter users or bicyclists or other coaster users off the hook. Like a 3,000 pound car, a 15 mile an hour scooter or bike can injure or kill a pedestrian going three miles an hour. Whoever is going faster has the greater responsibility. Whoever is growing, going faster has the greater responsibility. Even then, pedestrians wearing headphones while in public, rights of way, bear the modest responsibility of being aware that their presence affects the flow of foot traffic on the sidewalk and when they cross the street with headphones in, they are not using the public right-of-way properly either, but their responsibility pales in comparison to somebody operating a vehicle at speed. In Copenhagen, I just Googled this, the average biking speed is 10 miles an hour. A reasonably fit rider on a racing bike can go 25 miles an hour. The stopping distance for a typical vehicle at 20 miles an hour is about 40 feet. 20 to process it mentally, the other 20 to react. Reaction time goes up at a greater than one to run ratio with every 10 miles an hour in the chart that I Googled. But at 15 miles an hour, we can say safely that it's roughly 15 feet to process and another 15 feet to react. So a scooter user at 15 miles an hour needs about 30 feet to stop. I think we should be thinking about limiting the speed of the scooter to 12 miles an hour or maybe even 10. Uh, and when was the last time anyone read the rules of the road for drivers? We passed, um, the, you know, the, the require, we, we passed a thing uh, that allowed bicyclists to be on sidewalks because we couldn't enforce it. People were doing it anyway. And this way we removed liability. It wasn't that we were trying to encourage bicyclists to ride on the sidewalks. It's that we were trying to decriminalize it. Uh, and that's all that that's happening here now too. I think the whole dismount zone downtown should be painted, a painted box like the bike boxes are now. We should be putting up signs that go along with the painting of street surfaces. Scooter parking on sidewalks outside of downtown, yellow curbs on residential streets. You know, this is the kind of thing we need to be thinking about. The idea of banning them, I think is absurd. And really, we're talking, I mean, because half of the, the, what I've been hearing tonight, the critique, I always start hearing the word, it's the students. It's the students. Students are writing it. Students are citizens too. They live here too. Some of them ride too fast. Some of them ride drunk. There's 43,000 students here. There's not that many of them doing that. They're, we should not be painting them all with the same brush. We should be doing what the administration has done. I want to commend the administration. I've observed them working. I was out for about two months. And I think that, but I, I, was, I followed enough of what they did to say that I believe they did a, a great job with this legislation. And it's a good start. And we can improve some of it, but we shouldn't not pass this because we want something stronger, let's pass it and then add to it as we see fit. Thank you. Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, fortunately, or on, well, before I get there, I do want to thank the administration as well and our council counterpart for the hard work they've done to come up with some of these. Um, and I do anticipate some changes. Um, and for those looking in on CATS and those here in the audience, again, I periodically will say, uh, when we get issue items like this, all of a sudden we'll get bombarded with emails and other communications, and some of them the day of, <laughs> of the council meeting. 
So I, I just kind of want to apologize that if we didn't answer you or if I didn't, we will get to that. Um, so I don't want anybody to hold that against us, especially if I get maybe 60% of them <laughs> around noon today. Um, now, fortunately or unfortunately, multimodal transportation options is one of the things that we're promoting um, in our transportation plan and our UD and some of our city planning. Uh, so they're here. Um, if in fact you have an unfortunate accident in a swimming <laughs> pool, I don't hear very much discussion on banning swimming pools. I think there's some other options that you, you take care to make them safe and I think that's part of what we're talking about here tonight. Um, something else and this is, you know, we're Bloomington. Uh, if Bird and Lime and other scooter companies, as I understand it, are lobbying the state legislatures as we speak. Um, not that that's a threat, not that I'm saying anything at all, um, but banning I don't think is an option. It's not something I would want. Um, but don't be surprised if there's not some sort of a, something from the state that disallows communities from banning things. <laughs> Bloomington gets used, we're, we're kind of used for this, but don't be surprised <laughs> at that. Now, I'm not saying that's a reason not to consider some of the things we're talking about, but that's not, not a place that I'm, I'm looking to go. Full-time enforcement, um, and, and I think there will have to be some. One of the things I'm concerned about is that if we do that, how much of that is the responsibility of the companies that are bringing them? You know, I mean, I'm okay with education and full-time. But if we add another FTE, if we add another, my next question is who pays for that? I mean, I think we throw about a lot of stuff out here and we don't think about who pays for that. We're dealing with taxpayer money here. So that's my question. When you come up with these ideas, who pays for it? I'm not saying they're good or bad. That should be one of the considerations, who's going to pay for that? It's either yes or no in many cases that we're discussing. I've pretty much always promoted that there's, there's some middle ground in here, that there's a way that we can compromise, that we can um, uh, collaborate, we can, uh, I've heard a lot of good suggestions um, tonight. And maybe, you know, banning them on sidewalks downtown is a way to go. And, and you know, and, or, or, you know, using the, the bike lanes more you know, maybe that's the way, but there is a compromise here that I think that we're looking for, some common ground here. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I wish we could deal with this tonight, but I'm glad we got more time <laughs> so we can think about it and, and consider some other things. And I just want to thank everyone for their um, um, comments tonight. Um, I'm. Yeah, I, I don't know whether to pass or not. I, I, I really wouldn't pass. I'm, I really think I will support this with some of the changes and the amendments and the compromises that I feel will be coming. So um, thanks everyone for participating, my council members, and thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Sims. Uh, Councilman Piedmont Smith. Um, yes, I appreciate all the, the comments from my colleagues. I think there are a lot of um, things to, to think about in the next week before we take this up again. Um, some possible amendments to the ordinance that I've been considering is expanding the dismount zone um, and requiring all scooter parking in the dismount zone to be on the street and not on the sidewalks. As a matter of fact, I don't think there should be bicycle parking on the sidewalks either. It takes up space that pedestrians need. And um, when I say pedestrians, I include uh, people with disabilities. Um, the enforcement is really key, and I think that we've had, um, I think there has been very little, I mean, this is anecdotal, but in, from what I've heard and seen myself, there's been very little enforcement of the rules regarding bicycles on sidewalks, and they remain a problem um, in parts of town that are, uh, where the sidewalks are, are used a lot. Um, dismount zones are routinely ignored. Uh, so I think um, the only benefit here that we didn't have with the bicycles is that we will, we will have we will have money coming in 
with the licenses that we can use to hire people to do more enforcement. So, so that is a benefit, and I think we should take full advantage of that. Um, I think it's been mentioned uh, casually a couple times tonight, but I want to emphasize that these things fall over. <laughs> okay, you can have the best intentions, park it in the correct way. It's going to fall over. It's going to block the sidewalk. So I, um, I really like the idea, I think uh, maybe a member of the public mentioned that even outside of the dismount zones, in various uh, neighborhoods, we should have uh, boxes on the street for parking these. Um, because, you know, somebody could park it on a sidewalk and they'll ed park it right on the edge. It'll fall over. It'll get in the way. So this is, uh, this is problematic. Um, and I think I, I'm with Councilmember Chopra. We need to make sure our sidewalks are accessible. That is a really top priority. And so uh, I think we can do that with legislation. Um, and I think the scooter companies uh, need to pay for it, uh, to, to pay for the enforcement and the, the whatever paint we need on the, the streets. And um, I think that, that this, this could work. So I'm also going to pass tonight. Um, please don't think we're all a bunch of wimps by passing tonight, uh, but I think that there is, um, you know, there, there will be some amendments coming and, and we will uh, take a stand one way or the other next week. Thank you. Um, any other council members who haven't spoken yet? No. Um, I'll just say I agree with everybody. There's a lot to think about here. We're likely to see uh, significant amendments proposed for next week, and um, I have no problem with just, with just passing tonight and uh, voting on the amendments and whatever comes forward next week. So, um, move to pass. Second. It's been, it's been moved and seconded. We'll start on my far left, Councilmember Sanford. Yes. Pass. Yes. Yes. Pass. 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 That's three yes, three zero six. Three zero six. Uh, now we're ready for item number two, appropriation ordinance 19-02 to specially appropriate from the general fund, parks, general fund, local road, street fund, motor vehicle, highway fund, risk management fund, housing development fund, and vehicle replacement fund expenditures not otherwise appropriated. It's not a race, Mr. Ruff. <laughs> and, and it's a mouthful, though. <laughs> and um, we should have Mr. Underwood, our controller, uh, in the gallery somewhere to present on this one. Mr. Underwood. Good evening. Good evening to you. Give me just a few seconds here. That's what, that's what we, <clears throat> Got any jokes? That's good. Tell us a joke. No. Oh, you ready? Are we ready? Ready to go. I will be brief for both of our sakes. Uh, this is our annual uh, year-end appropriation of reversions. Uh, Ordinance 1902 request um, appropriate portion of the 2018 year of budget reversions. By the end of 2018, departments reverted a total of $4,743,695 in eight different funds. Uh, tonight we are requesting uh, reuse of that of just over $2 million. Uh, broken down into the following funds. So the majority of the money is in uh, the general fund, $1.1 million, uh, $22,000 in the parks general fund, uh, $193,000 in the motor vehicle highway, $267,000 in the local road and street fund, $45,000 in the vehicle replacement fund, $3,100 in the <coughs> risk management, and $350,000 in the housing trust fund. Uh, this is the breakdown in the general fund. I won't read through all of those. Sorry that it, it gets a little busy. <laughs> it always looks a little different when you're looking at it on your screen. I, I have to give kudos to the legal department. They've requested $100, so you might ask a lot of questions about that one. <laughs> uh, um, 
As I said, we're requesting just over $2 million out of the 4.7. That'll leave another $2.7 million that will remain in the cash reserves. Uh, GFOA recommends a minimum of uh, two months uh, in your f uh, general fund and rainy day your fund. Uh, I've done a little calculation here that uh, the combined end of the year general and rainy day fund was uh, $20,236,000. Uh, we have accounts payable, account we call them encumbrances in the government of $2,488,000. Uh, less the requested of reversions of 1135 would leave a net cash balance of $16,612,603. Uh, the general, the 2019 general fund budget was $45,183,242. That gives us coverage of 36.8%, uh, which is about 3.5% over the goal of 33.3%. Uh, and then this is just an exhibit of the uh, you're in cash balances uh, in those funds of just under uh, $30 million. And uh, I did include in your packet a detailed breakdown of those requests for departments. If you have questions about those specifically, I will try and answer them. However, if you have specific questions on departmental requests, uh, I'll try and answer it. But if not, if you would email me and the department head, we'll make sure that we have uh, more detailed answers if you have them uh, for next week's meeting. Happy to answer questions. Thank you, Mr. Underwood. Questions from Council. Councilman Rallo. Well, some details. Um, planning and Transportation, Schmidt Development Services, uh, a total of $175,000. What, what was that? What was that involved? Uh, I believe they are helping out in some of the um, local uh, zone plans. So this is a continuation of that. This is, and it's also backfilling on the planning transportation. You know they've had a number of, of vacancies. So this is outside consulting help to help us fill that gap as well. But Could, we can get you more detail. OK. Uh, maybe I can find some more detail in the meantime. Um, housing Development Fund, number 905, the $350,000 for hand department. Could you describe that? Yes. Could you um, the majority of that is, remember, we did a million dollar uh, appropriation of that fund. And as uh, Hand Department was working with the Crescent Development Group to finalize that, the actual agreement was not done by the end of 2018. So uh, they, didn't, they misunderstood that that money would not stay in uh, play. It wasn't encumbered, so it reverted. So we're just pulling this back in. I see. OK, thanks. Other questions from Council? Oh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yeah, um, I need to follow up on, on uh, the previous question. So Crescent Development Group for the development on um, south of 17th Street off of Crescent. Uh, I may have misspoke on who that, that's, I've got it in my head that way, but it was the um, major grant that uh, Housing and Neighborhood Development was working on for affordable housing. And that complete agreement was not completed by the end of 2018. So the money just went back into the fund. It didn't revert back to the general fund or anything like that. This just pulls it back in so that it funds, fully funds that agreement. OK, thank you. Um, I do have some uh, specific questions. I don't know. Um, maybe these are ones that I'll have to email. Um, the uh, HVAC replacement in the showers building, I thought that that was already in the budget. Is the $100,000, is that an additional amount that was not Right, as you remember, or? we've been doing that pieces at a time. So every time we have reversions or additional funds, year-end funds, we apply it to that project. So we're getting down towards uh, the end of that completion. I think we're on this end of the building, so. Oh, okay. So that's a, a type of project that can be done piece by piece? I'm right. There's surprised. multiple units, so they can replace units at a time. Yeah, there's not one huge unit that funds okay. the whole thing. And yes, we're trying to do a better, better job of balancing the heating and cooling. I'm preempting a question that Commissioner Volan might ask me. <laughs> um, the Winslow Sports Complex batting cage demolition, hasn't that already been done? That was in the paper today, I believe. Uh, I'm going to ask that question myself because the funds haven't been appropriated. So the departments know that if they proceed with projects before the funding, then they will not have to, they will not be able to do another project. They'll have the wrath of the controller's office. Upon them. Yes, yeah, it was not a pleasant uh, when I pulled up the online version and saw that. Is I'm going, wait a minute, we're talking about that tonight and voting on it next week. So, 
All right. Well, the, the other ones I'll just email to you because they are specific about, okay. about the different funds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Granger. I, thank you. I have a follow-up to the um, housing development fund. So mm -hmm. can it, I know it's not part of the reversion, but with, can you tell us how much is in that fund now? Uh, it was at about a million four or so. Uh, and that includes this 350? Yes, yes. Because we appropriated a million dollars in the 2018, and if you'll remember, we appropriated the, the remaining part in 2019, yes. which was about $450,000. Okay, thank it, you. It, it does earn interest income, and uh, some of the expenditures are, are repayments, so we get a little bit in repayments each month. So it, it stays around that million four, million One, five. Four. Okay, yeah. thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, anyone from the public want to make a comment? Oh. Councilmember Granger has another question. I'm, I'm sorry, I was writing. <coughs> couldn't write, couldn't do it at the same time. Uh, where is it? Oh, Office of the Mayor, Consultant for Innovation Design Thinking, $10,000. Could you talk about that? I, 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 will, I will have to defer to the mayor's office. So if you'll just, yeah, again, on those specific type things. If you could, do you want me to email that to you, or can you? Yeah, if you, just so I'll remember. So if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Or if you want to send them all to Dan and Dan can compile Thank them for you. me and Thank we'll get you. It, we'll get you answered. Other questions? Oh, Councilman Chober. Yes, I think this might be a question for um, our, our staff for Council Sherman. Um, seems like there's a lot of questions that aren't being um, answered, which is fine in the public sphere um, via meeting. I wonder if um, there would be a time or a place or a way to do so at our next meeting. I appreciate publicly published documents, but they're just not as visible or user friendly as presenting at a meeting is. And I think that these are important questions. So I guess my question is, is there a way um, for the questions to be compiled, but also for the answers to be um, read out loud and up for discussion at our next meeting since we can't do that today. Certainly, I think we've done oh. that. We've done that with yeah. the budget. Uh, you know, when we have our August rounds, you all uh, compile a list of follow-up questions and we provide answers and give that document not only the council, but we post that out on the website under the budget. So, so what we, I'm saying is I want it discussed publicly. Like. Well, and that's what I'm saying. Certainly, we, if we get those, we will compile that, we will publish it, and we can also try and put it up. I, I didn't bring this, I didn't, as a part of the document tonight, because it's, it's kind of busy, so trying to get it formatted so that it looked well uh, yeah. didn't work real well, because so it was like I'm three pages. So perhaps I'm not saying this well, <laughs> but I'm not interested in just a document that can be published. No, that's what I'm saying is, if you send us the questions, we will answer them and send that document back to you. Next week, I will put that up on the screen with okay. the questions and the Got answers, it. and if Got you it. have a follow-up, then. Okay. And that was the intent of sending the exhibit when we, we submitted the memo, was to give you additional details so that our, my hope was that if you had questions in advance that you could go get those and we would put them do this document, but we can do that for next week, so. I would really appreciate that. Yeah, I, we're happy to do Thank you very that. much. you'll be able to submit your questions to the council office or to and so is Friday a good time for you will you be able to get those questions so that we can turn them around by Friday and and that would give the controller's office a few days to do it does that work for you um, mr. chair yeah, I mean I'm just talking about the questions that were posed I'm sorry just the questions that were posed tonight is what I was referring to I didn't mean to open it up to this long process So, Councilman Chopper, was that directed more at, Count, at Mr. Sherman or at Mr. Underwood? I'm just trying to discern a process here, so anything, okay. any comments you want to make in that regard could be helpful. Oh, okay, so I specifically was just asking if the questions that were asked tonight at a meeting would be addressed. So I don't even, I'm not even requesting that we have a period for submission. Just, you know, we all know what the questions were that were submitted or they're in the minutes or on the record. Um, 
I'm those happy, are the questions. We're, we're happy to try and answer any and all questions, whether asked yeah. public tonight or you want to submit some after the fact, then we can get you those answers and we can have them so that they can be discussed. Thank you. I'm just asking yeah. that they, we compile them because I'm not writing them down and I don't do a very good job of trying to write down questions and talk at the same time, so. Um, Councilman Piedmont, did you have a question? Well, I was just going to recommend that everybody send their questions to Mr. Underwood via email. There's no need for council staff to take time to do that. I mean. Thank you. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Any other questions from council members? And we had an opportunity for the public. So we're back to council for final comments. Move to pass. It's been moved and seconded. Start on my right with Councilman Rallo. Yes. Pass. Yes. Pass. Yes. 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 Seven zero two. Seven zero two. Uh, recommendation passes, and that concludes our business for tonight. Uh, we're adjourned.